The Legislative Assembly is honoured to be situated on the ancestral lands of the Wadjuk Noongar people. We acknowledge the First Australians as the traditional owners of the lands we represent and pay respect to their elders, both past and present. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament now assembled, and that would be pleased to direct and prosper all our consultations to the advancement of thy glory on the true welfare of the people of Western Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass us against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Leader of the Liberal. Uh, yeah, uh, leave the opposition. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, I advise the House that on 24 November 2020, I was appointed Leader of the Opposition and the Member for VAS was appointed Deputy Leader of the Opposition. I also advise that the Member for Hillary's has been appointed the Manager of Opposition Business and for all our sins, the Member for Corrine remains the Opposition Whip. Thank you, Member. Um, brief. <laughs> I, members, I've advised members I've approved an amended seating plan for the opposition side of the House. Brief ministerial statements. Speaker. Minister for Health. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I rise to inform the House that the McGowan, McGowan Government has released the Climate, w, Climate Health WA inquiry uh, Climate yes. Health WA inquiry final report and endorsed its recommendations in principle. The Climate Health WA in inquiry was one of the key priorities within the Sustainable Health Review final report. It is the first statutory inquiry anywhere in the world focused on the health impacts of climate change. Key findings of the inquiry include recognition that climate action is necessary for health system sustainability and that the benefits of the, of the the benefits of change far outweigh costs when health is factored in. The inquiry found that the WA health sector is close to the starting line in a race to reduce its own emissions and waste, but is keen to go further and faster. This report sets a blueprint for the next, health, next 10 years of the WA health system's capability to adapt to climate change and better protect the health of the community and to support health services to do more to reduce emissions and waste without compromising the quality of patient care. The inquiry sought information from the WA community and, and Australian and international experts to obtain the best science, data and evidence to inform the recommendations. The report identifies that in the past decade there has been a lack of emissions reporting, evaluated initiatives, research and workforce training within the health sector. I would like to thank Professor Taran Wiramanthri and the inquiry team for their hard work, and especially around the extensive consultation. And of course, to the WA community who provided input into the inquiry. I now table a copy of the report, Climate Health WA Inquiry Final Report. Thank you, Minister. Paper tabled. Minister for Emergency Services. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'd like to take this opportunity to inform the House about the new mobile responsive website and the WA-designed app to help all Western Australians plan for bushfires, called My Bushfire Plan. Members, our state is more than 90 per cent bushfire-prone zone, uh, yet only one in ten Western Australians have a bushfire plan, and only 35 per cent of the community think they are at risk of a bushfire. As a community, we have to do more to prepare ourselves. <coughs> the new members, <coughs> excuse me. The new campaign urges people to rethink their personal risk and plan what they will do if a bushfire strikes. We know that indecision can be deadly during a bushfire. The website and app is supported by a new hard-hitting advertising campaign which depicts real-life bushfire scenarios and the confronting circumstances that people can face when they are not properly prepared. 
that how fireproof is your plan? Advertising campaign is deliberately emotive, emotive to bring home the reality of being trapped in a dangerous bushfire scenario on your property or in your car after leaving it too late to leave. Members, we know that when the community has prepared themselves and their property for bushfire, they increase their chance of surviving and reduce the demand on career and volunteer firefighters who time and again put their lives on the line to protect the community. <clears throat> the Australian First app and the new website will make it easier for people to make critical decisions ahead of the bushfire season by stepping them through what they will do if a bushfire threatens their home, when they will leave, what they will take and where they will go. It provides a single place to prepare, print, share and update your bushfire plan anytime from any device. It also includes preparation checklists, fact sheets, links to emergency WA for current bushfire information and the seasonal bushfire preparation reminders. We know there will never be enough fire trucks and water bombers for every house. It is up to all of us to plan what we will do in a bushfire. And now creating that plan is easier for everyone. My bushfire plan helps WA make WA a safer state. I urge all members in this House to encourage your community to visit mybushfireplan.wa.gov.au or download the app and make a plan today. It could save your life. Thank you, Minister. The Minister of Prevention of Family and Domestic Violence. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise today to inform the House about 16 days in WA to stop violence against women in 2020. You would have heard me speak last month about the McGowan government's plans for 16 days like this year. As many in this place already know, 16 days is about drawing attention to the many impacts of violence and abuse on women. More importantly, it is about encouraging conversations and action about what we can all do to end violence against women. Since the campaign launched on International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, November 25, I have had the privilege of being involved in some great community events. We have opened the state's first therapeutic women's refuge in Peel, Walang Bidi, which in Nua means healthy path. I was joined by the member for Mandra and the member for, Murray Wellington, for Wellington Murray. We have established two one-stop domestic and violent, family violence hubs in Kalgoorlie and Mirabuka. The hub is called Murraperni, which means many hands and represents the strong partnership approach that the lead agency, Hope Community Services, has brokered with local services to deliver the hub. Thank you for the member for Mining and Pastoral Region for joining me. Yesterday we celebrated the opening of the second hub, this time in Mirabuka, known as Nala Jukan Healing Centre. Nala Jukan means our sisters in Noongar and is very apt for the many women and their families that will be supported by this service. The lead organisation, the City of Stirling, in the Alliance of Community-Based Services delivering the hub, is very much looking forward to continuing its work to support women and families impacted by family and domestic violence. The member for Mirabuka has been a great advocate in her electorate and for these issues, uh, and I was pleased to be able to share in yesterday's opening with her. Yeah. Today is day 10 of 16 days. We have more to share with the Western Australian community before we get to day 16 on December 10. The delivery of these new and important community-based services, two one-stop hubs and a therapeutic refuge, a testament to how seriously the McGowan government continues to take family and domestic violence. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I advise the joint sitting of both houses was held on Wednesday 25th of November 2020 and the Benjamin John Small was duly elected as a centre, Senator of the Commonwealth Parliament. Have another speaker the statement. Members, I advise I approve the presence of television cameras and photographers for the first 20 minutes of question time today to enable the press to obtain vision of the new opposition leadership team and of us retiring members. Thank goodness a member for colleague Wellington, the way the camera is allowed to get the back of your head. Um, question time. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. The Premier, why have you indefinitely deferred any jobs target following the COVID-19 crisis? Uh, member for uh, uh, Swan Hills, I didn't realise you were the Premier, but I'll call you to order for the first time, Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, just prior to uh, 
Answering that question, can I firstly congratulate the member for Dawesville on becoming the opposition leader? Can I congratulate the member for Bass uh, on becoming uh, the deputy leader of the opposition? Can I thank the members uh, for Scarborough uh, and the members, uh, member for Nedlands uh, for their service as both opposition leader and deputy opposition leader? And can I also acknowledge today, and I think we'll do it further later on, the member for Mirabuka uh, and thank yeah. her for her service. Uh, in the parliament over the course of the last 12 years. Uh, and can I also acknowledge the member for Bateman, uh, who announced his retirement uh, last we this week. Uh, and uh, I expect both members will be making valedictory st statements later on today. And can I also, Mr Speaker, considering uh, this was a bit of an unexpected sitting, uh, thank all those members who are retiring once again. I don't know if anyone's going to put their hands up. And... <laughs> Any others? <laughs> Maybe half the national. Any others? No? No other takers? This is your last chance if you want to do a valid uh, And uh, Mr Speaker, can I also uh, acknowledge you? And uh, I think we did this before, but this is your last uh, day as, uh, as uh, sitting as Speaker uh, of uh, the West Australian Parliament. Uh, Mr Speaker, what happened uh, back in March and April of this year was obviously the world confronted uh, the biggest uh, economic crisis uh, since uh, 1929. Uh, and so uh, the government had to make a range of decisions and a range, very rapid range of changes uh, in order to cope with the situation uh, that we confronted. Uh, and the Cabinet, the Health Minister and myself in particular, uh, had to make a range of decisions very, very quickly. Clearly, we were being advised at a national cabinet level uh, that the country was potentially facing deaths in the hundreds of thousands of people, uh, and we're also being advised that it would potentially uh, become like a Great Depression. A Great Depression. Uh, so obviously, we had to um, deal with uh, and, and basically reflect reality uh, in terms of uh, uh, what the, uh, the some of the policies the government uh, had in place. Uh, the Premier's priorities uh, were aspirations, and I launched them, I think it was last year. They are aspirational targets by 23 24, uh, and uh, the reason we um, moved away from that is because we were facing this extraordinary economic cataclysm uh, as a state. The reality is, uh, since COVID hit, since that earlier part of this year, uh, we have now recovered around 90 around, uh, per cent of the jobs lost. Uh, we have created 63,000 more jobs than existed prior to our arrival in office. We are the only state with an economy that did not go into recession. The other states went into recession. Western Australia did not go into recession. Uh, and if you have a look at all of the figures, retail, land sales, car sales, um, payroll um, returns, um, uh, housing construction, um, and, and the like, uh, Western Australia is leading the nation. Our figures are outstanding, considering what is happening around the world. And the reason they're outstanding is we came up with a unique West Australian model. And the unique West Australian model was uh, we kept COVID out with hard borders. We allowed our uh, international economy to continue to flourish, in particular our trading economy. Didn't shut it down, despite some of the urging of some people around the country. Uh, and uh, then we um, ensured we got back to a state of normalcy as quickly as possible within uh, the hard borders, Mr Speaker. And the results are there for all to see. And, Mr Speaker, um, nationally, our state is doing far better than any other state. And I also add, Mr Speaker, uh, we're the only state that didn't go into deficit. The only state that didn't go into deficit. All the other states in the Commonwealth went into de deficits that are eye-watering, Mr Speaker, but not Western Australia. And we managed to launch our five and a half billion dollar recovery plan in July of this year. Uh, so, Mr Speaker, I think, um, I think Australians and West Australians in particular understand the situation confronting us was potentially catas cataclysmic, uh, but the reality is uh, this state, considering the fact we're now down at, at an unemployment rate of 6.6 per cent, with the highest participation rate in the country, uh, is doing better than anywhere else in the country and potentially better than anywhere else in the world. Supplementary yeah. lead the opposition. Thank you very much, Premier. Premier, given that WA and I quote has kept COVID out, when will you reinstate a jobs target and join with the Liberals in ensuring that there is a clear plan for the economy following the COVID-19 crisis? <laughs> Members, members. Mr. Speaker, I just remind the House the only reason we kept COVID out is the policies 
that we put in place that you opposed. That you opposed. The Liberal Party, the Liberal Party over the last 10 months has been disgraceful. Members. You have undermined everything we tried to do. The Health Minister and I went through sleepless nights, high stress, extreme circumstances, fighting to keep this state safe and strong, and all the Liberal Party did was undermine and complain the whole way along. And all you did, and all the Liberal Party did, was demand we bring down the hard border at the height of the pandemic. At the height of the pandemic. And then, Mr Speaker, as we know, as we know, the Liberal Party went out there and backed Clive Palmer. You went out there and backed Clive Palmer in his High Court case to bring down the borders, Mr Speaker. So the record is there, and you cannot run away from that record. The Liberal Party's record is there of trying to undermine everything we did, everything we did to keep this state safe and strong, Mr Speaker. But without a shadow cabinet, how do you have a target? Without any policies, how do you have a target? You don't have any policies and you don't have a shadow cabinet, Mr Speaker, and it's only three months to the state election, Mr Speaker. It's only three months to the state election. We don't have a shadow cabinet and we have an opposition who admit they have no policies. So, Mr Speaker, a slogan is not a policy. You need to actually come up with some policies. That's what the opposition needs to do. And you need to, you need to ensure, uh, in fact, I don't think you can uh, because you don't have a shadow cabinet, but you need to actually um, uh, try and give the people of Western Australia a little bit of confidence you know what you're doing. Yeah. The member for Mirabuka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's effort in keeping WA safe and strong, and I ask, can the Premier update the House on how this government's unprecedented $5.5 billion WA recovery plan is supporting more local jobs, more local businesses, and helping to drive more economic activity across the state? Can I uh, thank the member for Mirabuka for the question? And obviously, our approach to dealing with the situation has been very bold, Mr. Speaker. Uh, our approach has been based upon keeping the virus out, and we've now gone eight months without a single community case in Western Australia, unlike every other state in Australia, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we wanted to keep our key industries operating, and at a national cabinet level, uh, I was insistent uh, that our export industries would continue to operate in a COVID safe way. So that's why we got all the uh, FIFO workers from the east to come here, to come here and live, Mr Speaker. And indeed, major industries are now transferring uh, or transferring their workforces from the east or just employing locally, Mr Speaker, and enduring benefit for Western Australia out of what, is, uh, what has taken place. And then within our hard borders, Mr Speaker, we lifted restrictions far more quickly than any other state in Australia. And some other states in Australia only today talking about going to the two square metre rule. We've been there now, Mr Speaker, for probably six months. Uh, to, probably six months, Mr Speaker. Uh, it's a strategy that has been vindicated by every piece of economic data, Mr Speaker. Uh, we've shown that a strong health res response results in a good uh, economic uh, outcome, Mr Speaker. Yeah. And indeed, we were the first state government to release a recovery plan uh, back in July, Mr Speaker, back in July. So we did the policy work uh, in the midst of a pandemic and released a recovery plan back in mid to late July, Mr Speaker. That's what this government did in the height of a pandemic, Mr Speaker. Only state, Western Australia, only state not to, not to go into recession. West Australian economy is the only state to record growth in annual average terms. Uh, the West Australian economy in the September quarter has grown by 4.9 per cent, and that's underpinned by 11.7 per cent increase in household spending, which is the strongest in Australia, Mr Speaker, and I think the strongest in the history of the state, the house doesn't mean uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, and uh, if you go into business. restaurants and cafes, and I must say, people say to me all the time they can't book a restaurant and they can't get somewhere to stay in regional WA, which is testament, which is just, is that a good thing? Well, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I mean, I think it's a good thing. I mean, that's an idea. That's, I think that's a very odd interjection, Mr Speaker. I actually think it is a good thing that local small businesses are booming, Mr Speaker. Oh, whatever you say. Maybe for that, oh, just Speaker. don't say anything. Um, Mr Speaker, the building bonus that we put in place, first state in Australia, work with the Commonwealth to put in place the booming building bonus, Mr Speaker. Uh, we now have uh, finance for construction of new homes up 144% on 2019. Uh, and uh, in October, building approvals were up 96 per cent on the same time in 2019, Mr Speaker, the highest growth easily of all the states. 
terms of jobs, highest participation rate, uh, second lowest unemployment rate in the country by 0.1 of 1%, uh, and 87 per cent of the jobs lost have been recovered, 63,000 jobs created since we came to office, uh, and huge investment is part of our recovery plan. A whole range of things, TAFE Capital Works, schools uh, and the like, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, all over uh, Western Australia. Uh, and obviously a range of our uh, important projects are coming to fruition at exactly the right time. Uh, Metronet, we're out at uh, Thornley Coven Link today. Uh, nine projects currently under construction. Uh, planning reforms, new approval pathways, less red tape. Uh, our climate policy we launched on Monday, Mr Speaker. Uh, and uh, the LNG Jobs Task Force, the Future Battery Industry Strategy, Hydrogen Strategy, Defence Industry Strategy, uh, and uh, a range of other uh, important strategies to create jobs across this state. Uh, Mr Speaker, what is clear is this government is keeping our state safe and strong in the midst of a worldwide pandemic that is creating havoc all over the globe. Uh, Western Australia is a beacon uh, of, uh, a, uh, of, of people uh, who have done the right thing in difficult circumstances and businesses we have kept open uh, in the midst of difficult circumstances around the country and around the world. Yeah. Leader the Opposition. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier. Member for Wanneroo. I'll call you order for the first time. Thank you very much, Speaker. Premier, I re refer to record ambulance ramping in Western Australia for the third month in a row, and I ask, why has this government continued to fail the people of Western Australia by not addressing one of the most fundamental and critically important service delivery, service delivery areas for which your government is responsible? Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, as I said uh, when asked this question uh, before, uh, obviously our hospitals are coping with three things. Uh, firstly, um, there's a backlog of elective surgery because we closed down elective surgery for months on end. And so there's a huge backlog of elective surgery that has our hospitals performing at over 100 per cent when it comes to elective surgery. Uh, and, uh, and, and dealing with that actually fills beds in the hospital that obviously puts stress on the system, if you like, Mr Speaker. Secondly, and inside our emergency departments, uh, there are two streams. There are people who have um, respiratory conditions, Mr Speaker, and non-respiratory conditions. That is slowing down the activity uh, within emergency departments, and that is, of course, Mr Speaker, uh, a, uh, another uh, response to COVID. Uh, and we have seen a, a dramatic increase in mental health presentations, Mr Speaker, uh, and that, uh, that has been... Um, I don't know if that has been expected, but I suspect that is also a consequence of what has gone on uh, around the world. Uh, increase in mental health presentations, which is tied down, uh, as you know, our emergency departments. Uh, but, Mr Speaker, we're doing a whole range of initiatives uh, to deal with this. Firstly, uh, we have a huge expansion program on emergency departments around the state. Uh, so Joondalup Hospital, is, which is um, having the most difficulties, uh, has a $256 million uh, upgrade. Uh, that uh, this government is putting in place in conjunction uh, with the Commonwealth, Mr Speaker, uh, which has a major expansion to the ED, Behavioural assess Assessment Unit to deal with uh, drugs and alcohol and the like, Mr Speaker, uh, and a 30-bed acute mental health unit, Mr Speaker. Uh, if you go to the Peel Health Campus, and I was there on Sunday, uh, $10 million improvement to the ED. It's all happening, Mr right, Speaker, when happening. we were there. Uh, plus, we're also investing another $152 million uh, on a major upgrade to the hospital and ensuring it comes back into yeah. public control, Mr yeah. Speaker. Yeah. Uh, and we're providing the opportunity for a private hospital to be built uh, at that uh, site as well, Mr Speaker, as part of our uh, upgrades. And a range of other hospitals, uh, in particular Sir Giles Gardner, uh, is having $19 million spent uh, on upgrading uh, its ED, Mr Speaker. But it has been a difficult year. Uh, obviously, our hospitals have faced the difficulty as well uh, because of uh, the impacts, uh, some of them unexpected, uh, of COVID. Uh, and obviously, for a period, they were very quiet. But when they're very quiet, the backlog builds, and dealing with that has been a difficulty our hospitals are coping with. But I'd like to thank and congratulate our health workforce for all of their work during the course of this year. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary, Leader of the Opposition. Premier, can you confirm that the worst ambulance ramping on record is symptomatic of this government's broader failures to have a clear plan for health and hospitals in Western Australia? No. Mr Speaker, no. Premier. the answer is clearly no, but I just explained it to you. I just explained it to the Liberal Party, what has happened. And what we all, all we get, and this has been all this year, is undermining and nitpicking about everything we've had to cope with as a state. 
And, and our hospitals are another example of that, Mr Speaker. You undermine our efforts to try and deal with a very difficult situation that has occurred here. And, Mr Speaker, if you had had your way, if you had had your way, our emergency departments would be overflowing with COVID cases. If you had had your way, we would have had the situation that existed in the eastern states. Members if the on my left had their way, Mr. Speaker. And if you have a look at the emergency departments in Britain or the United States, you will see exactly what would have happened if the Liberal Party had had your way and you brought down the border at the height of a pandemic. Uh, the member for Jandicott. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Transport. Minister, I refer to the McGowan Labor government efforts in keeping the Western Australian economy strong and WA workers safe in their jobs through its significant investment in Metronet. And I ask, can the Minister please update the House on the work underway to deliver the Thornley to Coburn link? including the Ranford train station, and how this investment is supporting WA jobs and WA businesses. And can the Minister advise the House if she is aware of anyone who is seeking to undermine this investment in job-creating infrastructure? I thank the, Minister the member for, Transport. for Jan Cop for that question and, of course, his commitment together with the member for Southern River and the member for Thornley to the Thornley-Coburn link. Of course, we're out there today um, with, the with the Premier and the relevant members looking at a significant milestone of the Thornley-Coburn link. The Thornley-Coburn Thornley link currently has over 500 workers on site members and major work started today on the new Ramford Road Bridge. This project, like many projects, is giving Western Australians confidence, is giving Western Australian companies confidence. And today we met Ellie. Ellie was living over east, working on projects over east. She's come back to WA because of Metronet members. She's come back to WA to be with her family and to work on Metronet projects. Starting a Cert two in rail engineering and coming back to WA because we have a pipeline of, of investment. And whatever site you go to, you see Western Australians working and you see those Western Australians that had left coming back to WA because of the infrastructure certainty that we're giving members. A pipeline of work and something that we're very proud of. As I said, today we started piling works at the site. The Premier gave the go-ahead with a 120-tonne piling rig commencing work at the Ramford Road Station site. There will be 156 um, deep holes, 18 metres deep, filled with concrete um, as part of those works. And, of course... I love concrete. <laughs> Don't get me started on concrete. <laughs> the, new eight, the new eight-lane bridge, a new eight-lane Ramford Road bridge, six lanes for um, um, cars, another two lanes for buses. Absolutely incredible. We've also launched the Infrastructure Ready Program. The Infrastructure Ready Program, which is about getting people who want to change careers or get into our civil construction, give them the opportunity, a massive program. Now, members, while we're getting on with the job, what's the opposition doing, members? They are in, they are in disarray, divided, they are a mess, with no shadow cabinet, no policies and no experience. What do they have? They have a hashtag, a hat and a bus. That is what the opposition is presenting to the public of Western Australia. And if anyone, if anyone saw that media conference, yesterday. Now, now, many members would watch Veep, as you know, and what we saw were these two people emerge from a freshly painted bus to promise everything and say nothing, because it was a train wreck of an announcement. We're going to do stuff. Well, what are you going to do? We're going to do stuff. It's going to be better than them. That is the extent of their, of their commitment. On, on relevance, the question is on the question is on Metronet. This has nothing to do with Metronet. Not a point of order. In future, just uh, quote the uh, reference number, please. The standing order number. Don't you say relevance, please? Thank you. The question referred to people trying to oppose Metronet. We know the opposition opposes Metronet, don't they? 
So what have we learnt since the 11 days when the Leader of the Opposition knew he was going to become Opposition Leader? He no we know he knows a good spray painter. That's about it, members. <laughs> because they've got no policies. They go out with a major media conference with no policies apart from we're going to do lots of stuff, stuff. and it's going to be better than them. Stuff. You've got to do better, members. You've got to do better. Stuff. And we're looking forward to every day, every day until that election day, when we can compare the experience of this Premier keeping WA safe and strong to the divided rabble from the other side, whose focus on the first 11 days has been spray painting a bus and embroidering some hats, members. Uh, Maybe for more. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question, Mr. Speaker, is to the Premier, and I ask on behalf of the people of regional Western Australia: Will the Premier outline whether he and the Labor Party will fully commit to royalties for regions as it was intended? That is, 25% of royalties collected by the state dedicated to a statewide regional development program. Premier, members. Mr. Speaker, it's interesting because uh, there's only 25% of the National Party members here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mr. Ah, Speaker, um, they've changed the legislation. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, and one of and one of them's a ring-in, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, look, Mr. Speaker, as we said prior to the last election, we would keep royalties for regions, and that's exactly what we have done. That's exactly what we have done. Uh, and you ran a scare campaign uh, prior to the last uh, last election. You're out there uh, saying that uh, we were going to abolish the scheme. It turned out you were wrong. You ran another scare campaign where we were going to abolish the uh, country pension uh, fuel card. turned out again you were wrong. So, Mr Speaker, uh, we kept the scheme. Uh, we're ensuring it's spent wisely. We have pro proper budget processes, processes around it. We don't have the two budget processes that the Liberals and Nationals had last time that drove Colin Barnett nuts. Uh, we have a proper budget process whereby royalties for regions comes in to ERC and measures within it. I ticked off and go through the normal cabinet process, Mr. Speaker. But if you go all over, all over regional WA, you'll find all sorts of projects, important projects, being funded uh, by this government through royalties for regions. And yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I was in Bunbury for the uh, for the uh, for the opening of the jetty uh, jetty road, Mr. Speaker, the wonderful Bunbury waterfront project, Mr. Speaker. I want to congratulate the member for Bunbury. Uh, no, he's uh, he's oh. no doubt there, down there enjoying it, Mr. Not there. Speaker. Uh, not there. He uh, must be out with the nationals. Hey. We have about 85 per cent of our members here. You have, uh, you know. They all come from Perth. It's pretty easy uh, for them. So Mr. Speaker, so, Mr Speaker, I was down there yesterday for that important announcement. Uh, yesterday, Mr Speaker, I was uh, also in uh, Mandurah, Mr Speaker, for important upgrades uh, uh, to the, uh, the TAFE College, Mr Speaker. Uh, and uh, so our record stands, Mr Speaker. We are strongly supportive of regional WA. We're keeping an important project program for the people of regional WA. We're keeping the region safe and strong. And if you go out there and you have a look at industries all over the state, the tourism industry, the hospitality industry, mining, agriculture, Mr. Speaker, they're all very, very strong in the midst of a worldwide pandemic, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and that is what this government has ensured will continue to take place. Supplementary member for more. Thank you, Premier. And given your stated support for the program, when may we, we may expect an announcement that the $2.7 billion in cost shifts and underspend in the current state budget will be, in fact, returned to the Royalties for Regions program? Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the Royalties for Regions program is around a billion dollars a year. Uh, and all of that, Mr Speaker, is devoted to regional WA. All devoted to regional WA. All happens, Mr Speaker. But what is very clear is in the lead up to the next state election, there are going to be two sets of commitments by the opposition. Two sets of commitments. And this is a very big issue. Because if the opposition is elected, both of those have to be added together, Mr Speaker. There is no coalition between the Liberals and Nationals. No coalition. Uh, there is two parties form government, and each of their commitments are piled on top of each other. And what we saw last time you came into government is you nearly bankrupted Western Australia. That's right. You could not go to, you could not work together. You had two budget processes. It drove people uh, within the then government, uh, treasurers, uh, and the then premier mad uh, because of the difficulty of trying to govern with that arrangement, Mr. Speaker. And I just say to the people of Western Australia, do not risk the Liberals and Nationals. Yeah. Do not risk it. In the midst of what this country and this world is going through, you cannot risk that. You cannot risk it. 
You are not ready for government. No. You are too big a risk to the people of this Risky state. Party, too big a risk to the people of this state. And that is there are many reasons why, Mr Speaker. Many reasons why, Mr Speaker, the opposition is risky. But one of them is there will be two massive sets of commitments that will need to be added together, Mr Speaker. And clearly, and clearly, we went through that last time you were in office when we weren't in a pandemic, Mr Speaker, where you basically took the state's debt load from around $5 billion to over 40 in the midst of the most um, the, the, a boom time, Mr Speaker. So clearly the people of the state cannot risk the Liberals and the Nationals with the way you governed last time being put back into office again at the next election. Yeah. Member for Murray Wellington. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's efforts in keeping West Australia safe and strong, in particular its significant investment in health services across the state. And I ask, can the minister outline to the House how this government's $152 million investment in redeveloping the Peel Health Campus will ensure patients across the Peel and Murray regions are put first? And can the minister advise the House how this government's record compares to the way the Peel Health Campus was treated by the previous Liberal yeah. National Government. Mr Speaker. Mr for Health. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I was delighted to be with the member for Murray Wellington, the member for Mandurah and the Premier on the weekend to announce the new $152 million upgrade for the Peel, for the Peel Health Campus. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this is a very proud moment for everyone in the Peel region, because for years they've had to uh, deal with a hospital which was ignored by the other side. Eight and a half years, Mr Speaker, of no expenditure on the redevelopment of that hospital. You have to go back to the Gallup government days, Mr Speaker, to see the, pre the previous uh, in serious investment in this hospital, $3 million under that government, $10 million under the McGowan Labor government, Mr Speaker, to expand the car park and the, um, and the ED at that hospital. None, member for, none, Minister. No dollars at all were spent by the Barnett Liberal government during their eight and a half years in government. And Mr Speaker, in 2019, the Sustainable Health Review identified the Peel area as one of the areas of extreme need and, and, um, and need of significant uh, redevelopment. And Mr Speaker, since that time, the McGowan government has been working hard on putting together this significant development. The Peel region remains one of the fastest growing regions in Western Australia, so this $152 million redevelopment will reinvent the hospital, take it from a health campus to a true regional hospital serving the people of the Peel area. This is a win-win, Mr Speaker, for the, for the locals of Dawesville, Murray, Wellington, Mandra, for the entire Peel region, because, Mr Speaker, this, this uh, project delivers on a key election commitment by the McGowan Labor team that we will return into public hands privatised services where it is possible. And I'm very proud to say, Mr Speaker, that in August 2023, when this contract comes to its end, the uh, public health services at Peel Hospital will be brought back into public hands so that we can have world-class public health services for the people for of Peel once and for all. But more than that, Mr Speaker, we will continue to see private hospital services provided at that, um, that precinct by creating the opportunity to have a private hospital operating on that campus, similar to the, to the Bunbury Hospital. This is a great outcome for the people of Peel, Mr Speaker. It will involve significantly enhanced emergency care, mental health care, cancer care and palliative care. It has uh, 63 more public beds. We're taking up to around about 220 beds in all. New mental health facilities, Mr Speaker, a 20, new 20-bed 20 mental health ward as well as a new 10-bed mental health Very observation good. area. Very between 15, uh, there will be between 15 and 20 palliative care beds, member for Murray Wellington, as well as between 8 and 20 chemotherapy chairs. Plus, in the future, Mr Speaker, we'll be allowing all those staff who currently work there now to transition across to the public, uh, to the public hospital team with their, with their entitlements intact, Mr Speaker. So, Mr Speaker, this... Well, member for Murray Wellington, it might surprise you to hear that it was the member for Dawesville who was the previous member. And not, um, and not a dollar was spent on this. 
So the question to the current member for Dawesville, Mr Speaker, is if we did, were, if we were so unfortunate as to have to endure another Liberal government, would you bring those services back in house? No, 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 no. So, Mr. Speaker, what we have here is this, this usual Mimbish. equivocation. People, people want to see money. No plan You're not putting a dollar on the emergency Speaker. department at all. No plan. Thank you, Member. No hey, plan. I want to hear this in silence. Thank you. No plan for Sorry, the Kirsten. for the Peel Hospital, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> so, Ms. Well, a leader of the opposition, um, you don't get a free go. I will call your order for the first time. So, Mr Speaker, there is an election in the wind and the people of Western Australia have a choice. We have a choice about whether we keep Western Australia safe and strong, whether we put patients first. And for the people of Dawesville, Mandra and Murray Wellington, the question is clear. There is only one government that will invest in the future of Peel Health and there's only one government that will bring these services back in house and that is a Labor McGowan government. Ooh. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Science. Can you explain why there are gaping holes in your proposed electric vehicle network, including 1,600 kilometres of the Great Northern Highway? Members. In addition to the fact the EV network does not even link up with South Australia? <laughs> Heavens above. Well, I want to congratulate the. Uh, I want to congratulate the new deputy leader of the opposition for uh, for Member asking for the Dorothy really Sexer time. for uh, in respect of EVs that I was going to get asked a bit later on. Oh, so, <laughs> so, thank you very much, uh, Member for Vass, for asking me a question about our new electric vehicle strategy. We're very proud of the strategy that we announced uh, earlier this week. Electric vehicles have been around for a while, and I do remember that under the eight years of the former government, you did nothing, you did nothing to promote this technology. Now, you probably don't know that, you probably weren't paying attention, but during the eight and a half years, you did nothing. Now, what we have done is we have consulted with industry on how best uh, to kickstart EVs in WA, because EV take-up in Western Australia is low. It is very low. There's, a, there's less than 1,500 EVs on the road in Western Australia, uh, less than 1 per cent. So what can government do? What can government best do uh, to kickstart this industry? So what we've done, we've announced uh, a $21 million strategy, which includes the longest uh, uh, charging EV station network uh, in Australia. You'll be able to go from Esperance all the way to Kununurra. So the longest in Australia, arguably uh, one of the longest in the world. Now, you're not happy with that? Sure. It doesn't go everywhere in Western Australia, that's for sure. But what it does do is it builds the spine. It builds the backbone of a network. So people can have the confidence that they can leave their major towns and go uh, throughout most parts of the state with their electric vehicles. So sure, there are parts you can't go to, but you will be able to drive from Esperance to Kununurra, you'll be able to go to Kalgoorlie. Uh, the, the response from industry has been overwhelmingly positive. <laughs> Overwhelmingly positive Members because on my left. They, see, they see this as a major step forward. And we, we know that once we do this, other players will come into the market and build out the network. They will build out the network. So we have put the first significant money of any state government uh, into uh, elect an electric vehicle policy. The, arguably one of the largest networks in, a, in the world, overwhelming endorsement from industry, and you, you're complaining about it. Yeah. Absolutely out. <laughs> astonishing. Supplementary. Supplementary. Yeah. Members. 
Supplementary. Supplementary. Minister, why at the announcement did you not even know how many charging stations your EV network has? Is it because is it is it because your Members Members It's a bit of a stretch. You don't know yeah. You don't know how much Metronet costs. Members you stop Minister, interjecting me. Why at the announcement? Minister for Transport. I call it order for yes. the first time. Minister, why at the announcement did you not even know how many charging stations your EV network has? Is it Members. because your government has failed to do the proper work over four years? Or did you just forget? Members. Uh, look, um, Mr. Speaker, Members. we've announced it's the biggest investment in EV charging networks in Australia. Of any state, uh, it's, uh, it's the biggest financial investment. Oh, it's big. For vast. Oh, the network may be big. Yes, it's big. It's one of the biggest networks in the world. You will be able to drive from the opposition to Kununurra. You'll be able to go to Kalgoorlie, and once the spine of that network is in place, as EVs pick up, other places will be filled up. Now, what we've said is we are going to further consult with industry about how we build that network, and that will impact upon exactly where the charging stations are placed, uh, how many whether they are you know, 25 kilowatts, fetch. whether they are 50, whether they are 350, the size of those charging stations, all that will be worked out because we're going to talk to industry about that. It will be based on the... Have you read the report that UWA did? Yeah, well, you will know, you will know that a substantial Member amount Vesh. of work has... Member oh. for Vass, I call you for the first and second Look, time. I'm, I must admit... Uh, it's, it's extraordinary. You know, th this was the question that I was going to get asked later on because no, we are so pleased with this announcement. Industry is so pleased, uh, and yet once again you are nitpicking, nitpicking, nitpicking. We're working with industry; they're happy. Uh, you know, it's extraordinary. One of the longest EV charging networks in the world, the biggest in Australia and you're not happy. Member for Mount Lawley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Police. Minister, I refer to the work undertaken by the McGowan Labor government to keep Western Australia safe and strong through its unprecedented support for our hard-working police officers. And I ask, can the Minister outline to the House what the McGowan Labor government's historic police compensation scheme will mean for medically retired police officers across Western Australia? Minister for Police. I thank the member for Mount Lawley uh, for that question and for his uh, very strong support of our police officers, indeed his strong support of all workers and, and their protections uh, in the workplace. Uh, I'm delighted, Mr Speaker, with the commitment that the McGowan Labor government has made to police in this state. We've increased the size of the police budget. We've relegated to history those cuts that were put in place by the former Liberal government. And we've increased the size of our uh, police budget by about $750 million. Uh, this is huge. It is significant. Uh, we're committed to keeping our community safe. And as part of doing that, we have to support our police to do that job to keep our community safe. Uh, we have committed to an unprecedented 1,100 additional officers. 150 of those were delivered first off. 150 that we committed to only in April have already been engaged. And the further 800 uh, committed to during the recent police budget uh, are, uh, are already uh, programmed. The first 200 of those will be engaged in this financial year, that is before June 30th this year and 200 a year thereafter. I'm also pleased that we've provided the protections that they need to do the job, the personal issues stab proof vests. Uh, but nothing pleases me more than perhaps my uh, the original commitment uh, where we covered police officers with OCH Health and Safety after years of them not having that, uh, than now to be able to offer the, uh, the compensation when they leave the job. It was a three-part plan. We delivered $16 million a couple of years ago uh, for the police redress scheme for, uh, and offered payments of up to $150,000 to those people who'd been poorly treated in the past, and we offered uh, them that redress. 
In addition to that, Mr Speaker, uh, last year I moved through the parliament uh, the uh, amendments to section 8 of the Police Act, so we no longer retire those police officers under the same undignified uh, process that we do those officers that have a uh, a cloud of corruption hanging over them. And now the final piece. Uh, universally welcome and applauded at the recent police conference uh, that we will provide uh, that police compensation. We'll do it through the Police Act uh, and we will provide, uh, we'll provide this end of service payment in addition to keeping all current in-service and post-service entitlements. That was the key point that was never offered uh, under any former government. Uh, every former government wanted to take something away in terms of uh, existing police conditions. We're not doing that. Uh, we will uh, provide for termination uh, payments capped generally at around $236,000, but potentially up to $413,000. There will be a payment for vocational support and retraining of up to six, of, uh, potentially over $16,000. Uh, we will maintain those current in-service and post-service entitlements uh, for uh, work and non-work-related illness or injury. And those leave payments for medical expenses provided to an officer would not be uh, included in the calculation for an exit payment. Officers also preserve their option to seek an ex gratia payment or an act of grace payment. Uh, this is an amazing step forward. It's something that uh, police officers in this state have deserved. We ask those officers to run toward danger, to protect us, to protect the community, to turn out to road crashes, to go to horrific scenes where people have been murdered uh, and where other violent acts have occurred. Uh, we, in turn, need to support them. And I have never been prouder of the McGowan government than when our Premier stood there at the recent police union co conference and made that commitment that if a McGowan government is re-elected early next year, that will be a priority for us. Uh, the member for Geraldton. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Transport. Minister, I refer to the proposed Dongra to Geraldton bypass route, which will directly impact houses, including some that are heritage listed, properties and livelihoods in the walkway area, as well as the environmentally sensitive wetlands in the Alanooka area, area. And I ask, Minister, will you table the business case for this route and detail any alternative routes Main Roads is considering? Minister. I thank the member for Geraldton for that question. Now, as I've outlined before, um, this issue has been a uh, hard um, sort of issue to tackle over many, many years. Now, the route definition work actually started under the previous government, and the inland uh, route was actually uh, the preferred model that was taken to the then, uh, as I understand, minister back in 2015. 2016, and nothing ever eventuated in respect to dealing with the public. So what we did is when we won government, a key issue was put to me was that we need certainty. And I remember meeting with representatives from the corridor saying, from the relevant council saying, we want certainty. We want to have the route alignment finalised. So can you get on with doing it? And that's what we uh, sought to do. So as you know, there was a corridor released. Not that route alignment, but a corridor release, and that is up to out for public consultation. All those issues you've raised in relation to impact on stru homes, structures and other issues will be picked up as part of that. And I urge the National Party to work with the residents to put their views across. Because you can work with them, you can put submissions, you can use your talents and your expertise in working with those residents to make sure that their submissions are high, high highlight their concerns. And so that is why we're going out to public consultation. We also understood that this was an issue that affects many people, so we've extended the public consultation to uh, March the 31st. There is no route alignment, it's a preferred corridor, as in there's no specific route alignment, there's a preferred corridor. And as I said in a meeting up in um, Geraldton, as I've said in numerous um, uh, radio and television interviews, we are now going through the process of talking to everyone to see how we can make sure that that alignment does not impact or minimises the impact on private land ownership. The other point, member, and the point you need to be aware of, is your, is your preferred um, solution the Brand Highway? Because that actually affects more landowners. 
and that affects more landowners. So it's always easy to say, don't do that one, because that impacts um, so many, but your proposed, if that is your proposed route, actually affects more. So we're going to have a careful, considered approach. I urge the National Party, if you want to engage in this, if you want to engage in this, work with the landowners, put forward proposals, put forward alternatives. Just don't say no, put forward alternatives, and we're very keen to sit down and talk to you about that. And as a local representative, that's what you should be doing. Because I know when I was in opposition, and there were issues in my community. I worked with the community to put forward their suggestions. I just did, I wasn't a lazy opposition member who just fueled fear, um, fear in the public. I actually worked with people to make sure that we could actually put forward um, po um, good solutions. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, given the significant impact that this proposed bypass will have on the walkaway community. Minister, will you commit to meeting with the impacted families ahead of the 2021 state election? Minister. There will be no decision on the alignment before the consultation finishes. So the consultation finishes on March the 31st. Before any, any um, decision is made, I commit to work uh, to meeting with the community, but that is after the first round of consultation and before any decision is made. So, you know, you want to make this into an election platform. You want to make sure, instead of actually helping people and working with people, wanting to make them scared, if that's what you want to do, you do that. But there's an opportunity, as, an op as the member for Geraldton, to actually work with the community and put forward some options and some alternatives and actually work. Now, if you want to go and tell the 100 landowners, if you want to go and tell the 100 landowners along Brown Highway what you're going to do to their land in your suggestion, you do that. But don't come in here and just say, do this or do that. There is no decision. There is a discussion and community consultation. There is a corridor. But if we can improve and make sure the route alignment minimises any impact, takes into, the consider, concer, takes into account all the concerns, we'll do that. Of course we'll do that. But stop being lazy. And I've seen the comments that... Work with the community, put forward some viable suggestions and we'll listen to you. Uh, the <laughs> speaker, in my haste to get to my feet. Calamanda. <laughs> speaker, my question is to the Attorney General, and I refer to the Corruption and Crime Commission's recent report on the misuse of electorate allowances by Liberal members of Parliament. And I ask, can the Attorney General outline to the House what the report revealed about the activities of some of the members of the Procedure and Privileges Committee in the Legislative Council. Attorney General. I thank the member for Kalamunda for the question, and it's a very important question he asked. When the report on electoral allowances and the management of electoral offices was uh, published by the CCC last week, a lot of the publicity surrounded the titillating revelations that members of the Liberal Party were using public funds for sex holidays in uh, Japan and wine tours in South Australia. And whilst that is uh, shameful and scandalous enough, beneath that, and when you dig down into the report, there is corruption at the highest echelons of the Liberal Party, and it's absolutely shameful. Uh, it was uh, on the 1st of April 2019 the 1st of April 2019, Mr Edmund, whilst he was under orders from the CCC not to tell anyone about the inquiry, warned a number of people, including a member of the Liberal Party, Mr Brian Ellis, Mr Hallett and the Honourable Ricky Mazza, of the CCC's inquiries and what they were inquiring into. Uh, <clears throat> On the 16th of August this year, Mr Edmund received a text from a member of the Privileges Committee, not being the Honourable Ricky Mazza, offering support. And when this uh, report was being handed down, the Premier was briefed, as the Leader of the Opposition was briefed upon its contents, and the CCC were asked by the Premier, was any member of the Labor Party involved, because we don't want any member of the Labor caucus involved in corrupting the inquiries into this. An assurance was given, and an assurance was given that the unnamed members in this report were either Liberals or shooters and fishers. So that when we go to uh, the... Um, <clears throat> 
the report, paragraph 437, Mr Edmund received a text message from a, from a Procedure and Privileges Committee, a male person, so that excludes the President, this must be the Honourable Simon O'Brien. And indeed, the Honourable Simon O'Brien, uh, on the 5th of September, in the Legislative Council, said, I might add that I feel some empathy for anyone caught in the situation that Mr Edmund and his family seem to be caught in at the moment. So he was expressing support publicly in the Parliament for Mr Edmund, whom we know is corrupt on the findings of the, of the report. It was only just two days before uh, that the Honourable uh, Simon O'Brien telephoned support for Mr Edmund, two days before that, that's on the 14th of August, that the Privileges and Pri Privileges Mem Committee Attorney tabled General. the report... What? Attorney General... Attorney General is making unsubstantiated allegations against a member of the other place. And unless there is substantiation, he doesn't have the ability to refute that. I seek your advice as to whether he's able to do that. Members. making accusations about the other house as long as you have fact to back it up. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank you for your advice, and I will be careful. Just two days before, just two days before the uh, text message went from the member of the Privileges Committee, uh, uh, not being the Honourable Ricky Mazza and not being a female, therefore being a, uh, a member of the Liberal Party, uh, just two days before that, <coughs> uh, the Privileges and... Pr uh, Procedure and Privileges Committee tabled the report, number 55, banning uh, Darren Foster from handing over the former Liberals' emails uh, to the CCC. And we can all recall what, uh, uh, what Mr Edmund said should happen uh, to that computer and those emails, because in the previous report, Mr Edmund said that the best thing that could happen to that computer is it should be thrown in the river. At the moment, it's locked. At the moment, it is locked in the safe of the um, uh, of the Parliament in the upper house. Now, this this is this this this, this whole procedure. This whole procedure of the committee has been corrupted by someone within that committee. By someone within that committee, ringing up, ringing up a target of the CCC ringing up a Liberal colleague who was a target, a former Liberal colleague who was a target of the CCC to offer support for them whilst they were sitting on that Privileges Committee. So it's not good enough for the, for the new leader of the opposition to go out and say, we will not tolerate corruption at any level in the, in the Liberal Party. We will not tolerate corruption at any level. It's up, to the, it's, up, it's up to the new leader of the opposition now to go out and ask Mr O'Brien whether this was him who sent this text message, this voicemail message to Mr Edmund. And if it is, he should be asking Mr O'Brien to resign from the Privileges Committee and the Liberal Party should throw him out of the Liberal Party room before Christmas. Before Christmas. Otherwise, there's no room for the new leader of the Liberal Party to say we are against corruption at all level. You will go into this election with a stinking mess hanging around your neck like a dead albatross if you don't deal with this corruption at this stage. This state cannot afford to return to a party that tolerates this sort of corruption and this sort of cover-up, uh, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Member for Hillary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Premier, I refer, for water. I refer to the out-of-control crime in Broome, which has reached the point that the local community is forced to organise a community rally. And I ask, why are you and your ministers ignoring the people of Broome by refusing to attend this crime rally that is being held next week? Uh, Mr. Premier. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I became aware of uh, this issue uh, very recently. Uh, the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs uh, will be 
uh, attending the rally, as indeed will be uh, or the, the meeting, uh, as indeed will be the uh, local MP, uh, as indeed will be uh, at least one assistant uh, commissioner of uh, police, uh, uh, assistant commissioner uh, Darrell uh, Darrell Gaunt, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but it is uh, it is the case, Mr. Speaker, that uh, we are investing a great deal of effort and a great deal of money in a range of initiatives across the Kimberley. Uh, in order to deal with um, uh, and assist youth. Um, you've got to actually provide uh, opportunities for young people to do things that are constructive. Uh, you've got to provide opportunities for, people to get, for young people to go on the right pathway. Uh, and so there's $6.2 million of initiatives in the Kimberley Juvenile Justice Strategy, including night patrols, uh, youth engagement program, integrated learning program uh, across the Kimberley. There's $150,000 granted to Agunya uh, Limited to implement the Broom Purpose for Life program, uh, and uh, as you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've invested hugely uh, in schooling, uh, in TAFE, uh, in uh, additional um, opportunities for uh, residential uh, living uh, for students from across the Kimberley uh, to provide them with those pathways and those new ways uh, forward in terms of um, uh, in, you know self improvement and uh, providing opportunity for young people. Uh, so. Um, Mr Speaker, on top of that, of course, uh, the state government has announced uh, and has funded uh, over this term uh, and the next 1,100 additional police officers. 1,100 additional police officers, Mr Speaker. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, a great many of those will go to regional Western Australia. Uh, and uh, they'll be involved, as regional police officers are, uh, not just in law enforcement but with working with young people. Uh, I was in Newman recently and uh, police officers were there uh, playing football uh, with uh, young uh, uh, youth, uh, in order to uh, in, in order to engage them, Mr. Speaker, uh, and uh, ensure that uh, uh, police work with uh, young people. Uh, so all those initiatives are out there, Mr. Speaker. We're doing all of those things, uh, and uh, they're all very constructive. Uh, and if you go to Broome and the Kimberley, you'll find no government ever has put as much effort into these sorts of social initiatives, uh, these sorts of um, infrastructure to create jobs, Aboriginal employment programs, uh, Aboriginal business, business programs, uh, public sector employment of Aboriginal people, all of the things uh, that will improve the lives and the outcomes and the opportunities uh, of people all over the Kimberley, in particular Aboriginal people. Supplementary. <coughs> Premier, given that you and your minister seem to be able to fly to Broome all the time for good news announcements, why did, it take, why did it take such significant negative media attention before any minister finally relented and accepted to go to this uh, meeting organised next week? Mr Speaker, once again, was this MP a ridiculous and pathetic uh, supplementary, Mr Speaker? But I will tell you somewhere I've been recently. I went to Hillary's, Mr Speaker, and I announced the new primary school. Now, I announced the new primary school there in Hillary's, Mr Speaker, Remember with our Hillary's, outstanding can't have a candidate, ways. Caitlin Collins, Mr Speaker, an educator uh, committed to young people uh, throughout Western Australia, and I'm sure uh, that she will do a great job in that electorate if you, she is elected, Mr Speaker. And I'll tell you what, Mr Speaker, she'll be a much nicer person than you are. That's the end of question time, members. Personal explanation, Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to rise to make a personal explanation under Standing Order 148. On Tuesday, the 8th of September 2020, during debate in this chamber on the topic of police numbers, I referred to an article published in the Western Australian on the 4th of September 2020, which carried the headline "Violent Thugs Free to Roam." The article was about the suspended sentences handed down to two men. Ibrahim Mohammed Asij and Ibrahim Salih for assaulting a man in Northbridge in July 2017. The article was accompanied by a photograph of Ibrahim Mohammed Asid gesturing with his middle finger upon leaving court. During the course of the debate, I might mistakenly described Ibrahim Salih as flipping the finger when it sh I should have referred to Ibrahim Mohammed Asid. I hereby correct the record as both offenders are no longer free to roam after the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions appealed their suspended sentences, resulting in the Court of Appeal imposing a significant jail term on each man. Thank you, Member. Any petitions? Member for Gerald. Oh. Can you talk a bit louder, please? Uh, Sorry. I can't hear you. 
I'm seeking a, um, an answer to a question on notice. Yep. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise understanding order 82 to ask the Premier when I may expect to receive an answer to question on notice number 6174 that was due on the 21st of June 2020. Uh, I'll chase that up, uh, Member, and find out where that question is and get it to you as soon as possible. Thank you. Petitions. Mr Speaker. Member for Bell Carter. Mr Speaker, I have a petition that has been certified as conforming with the standing orders of the Assembly. It has 226 signatures. The petition says, to the Honourable the Speaker, members of the Legislative Assembly of Parliament WA in Parliament assembled, we the undersigned say that regular offensive and nauseating odour emissions stemming from Ingham's Enterprises, Proprietary Limited, 9 Baden Street and Osmond Park and Steggall's Factory Outlet at 124 House Street and Osmond Park continue to cause a major nuisance to local residents in Osmond Park and Joondana who are unable to keep windows open or spend time in their backyards and that this issue has continued unabated for many years without significant action by the owners of the facility nor relevant government departments. Now we ask the Legislative Assembly to consider resolution to this issue by immediately having relevant government departments investigate the property and non-compliance with current licence conditions, ensure any licence renewals have wide public consultation and strict conditions imposed to prevent odour emissions in the future, and encouraging the landowners to move to a more appropriate location closer to their other operations and away from residential properties. Petition table. Uh, member for more. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I have a, a petition signed by 140 petitioners uh, and has been certified by the clerks as conforming to the standing orders. Couched in the following terms, Jury Bay Marina, to the Honourable the Speaker and members of the Legislative Assembly of the Parliament of Western Australia in Parliament assembled. We, the undersigned, say toxic water quality in the Jury and Bay Marina has resulted in repeated fish kills since 1996 due to the build-up of decomposing seagrasses causing anoxic conditions. Monitoring of the marina area has indicated that a sea groin is needed to remedy this problem. Now we ask the Legislative Assembly to call on the Government of Western Australia and the Minister for Transport to immediately take action and consider an engineering solution to prevent further fish kills. Thank you, Member. Member, message number 41 from the Governor. The, honour, the Governor has the honour to inform the Legislative Assembly of Western Australia that this day is centred in the name of behalf of the Queen to bills for the undermentioned Acts, COVID-19 Response Legislation Amendment, Extension of Expiring Provisions, Act 2020, Number 39 of 2020, Environmental Protectment, Protection Amendment Act 2020, Number 40 of 2020, Environment Environmental Protection Amendment Act Number Two, 2020, Number 41 of 2020, Honourable Kim Beasley, Governor. Message Number 42: The Governor has the honour to inform the Legislative Assembly of Western Australia that is this day assented in the name of behalf of the Queen to the bills for the undermentioned Acts. Appropriation Recurrent 2020 2021 Act 2020 Number 42 of 2020, Appropriation Capital 20. 2020-21 Act 2020, Mutual Recognition, Western Australia Act 2020, number 44 of 2020. Honourable Kim Beasley, Governor. Uh, papers for tabling, Clark. The following papers are presented for tabling annual reports 2019-2020, the Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency, Legal Contribution Trust, National Health Practitioner Ombudsman and Privacy Commissioner, WA Industry Link, received by the Clerk of Legislative Assembly and deemed tabled on 27 November 2020. Committee report, Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption on the Commission for Children and Young People. Discussion paper, in their own voice, the participation of children and young people in parliamentary proceedings received by the Clerk of the Legislative Assembly and deemed tabled on 26 November 2020. Government response. Legislative Council Standing Committee on Public Administration. Government response to Committee Report Number 33, Private Property Rights, the Need for Disclosure and Fair Compensation. Ministerial decisions under the Planning and Development Act 2005. Decision of the Minister for Planning pursuant to Section 2462A of the Act in relation to application DR166 of 2020. Determination of applications for review DR362 of 2013 and DR444 of 2013 in accordance with section 2462A of the Act. Reports. Aboriginal Affairs Planning Authority Act 1972, Report of the Aboriginal Affairs Authority Version 2. Corruption and Crime Commission Report on Electorate Allowances and Management of Electorate Offices 
received by the Clerk of Legislative Assembly and deemed tabled on 26 November 2020. Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, a review of the Conservation Legislation Amendment Act 2011. How are Western Australian Joint Management Arrangements working? July 2020. Department of Committees, Disability Access and Inclusion Plan Minister's Progress Report 2019 to 2020. Reports by the Office of the Auditor General received and deemed tabled by the Clerk of the Legislative Assembly on 26 November 2020. Regulating Minor Pollutants Report No. 8, November 2020, Western Australian Registry System Application Controls Audit Report No. 9, November 2020, Report for the Quarter End of 30 September 2020, Western Australian Treasury Corporation. Papers tabled. I have a speaker statement correcting to a tabled report. I received a letter dated 3 December 2020 from the Acting Commissioner of the Corruption and Crime Commission requesting that an erratum be added to the Commissioner's report on electoral allowances and management of elected officers, which was tabled on the 26th of November 2020. The erratum corrects an error in the type of communication reported at paragraph 437 of the report and also corrects the date of the communication and the supporting footnote. Under the provisions of Standing Order 156, I authorise the necessary correction to the attached as an erratum to the table paper. Have another correction to table report. I received a letter from the Premier requesting that an erratum be added to the Department of Premier and Cabinet's annual report 2019-20, which was tabled on the 24th of September 2020. The erratum addresses errors on pages 54 and 55 of the report relating to expenditure totals for market research. Under the provisions of Standing Order 156, I authorise the necessary corrections to be attached as an erratum to the table paper. Uh, any notices of motion? I hope not. And I inform members that in, in accordance with Standing Order 144A, the private member's business on the order of the day number one that appeared in the last notice paper as job creating projects has not been debated for more than 12 calendar months and has been removed from the notice paper. Today I received within the prescribed time a letter from the Leader of the Opposition in the following terms. Mr Speaker, that this House notes the clear choice at the up upcoming state election between a safer, smarter today for a better, brighter tomorrow under the Liberals as opposed to Labor's cynical business as usual politics. Members. Um, to, <laughs> the matter appears to be in order. And there are at least five members who will stand. Ooh, a bit slow on the back line there. Uh, they are, and the matter can proceed. Good on you. Speaker. Uh, Minister for Water, Corey Order for the first time. Uh, a Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, I wish to move that this House notes the clear choice at the upcoming state election to, between a safer and smarter today for a better and brighter tomorrow under the Liberals as opposed to the Labor's cynical business-as-usual politics. Yeah. Speaker, yesterday the Liberal Party was pleased to announce an exciting new target for job creation in Western Australia at a time when our state needs it most. Yeah. We know that our state Members. is the powerhouse of the national economy and that our people of Western Australia deserve a bold and exciting vision for new local jobs, for small businesses and for strong economic growth. And what we've found already from the Premier and the government here today is that it's very clearly there is only the Liberal Party who is looking forward to the future while the Labor Party continues to return to business as usual and talk about the past so long as it is politically expeditious for them to do so. It is only the Liberal plan Party who will deliver a plan for an even stronger, brighter future for Western Australia. The Labor Party, we know, has no plan for economic reform. It was evident a couple of days ago when we saw the figures released for the national accounts that so showed that West Australia had the slowest gain of any state in the country except Victoria, except for Victoria, which was in lockdown. We know that the Labor, the Labor Party has no plan beyond the pandemic. We know that the Labor Party continues to talk about COVID-19 and what has happened because, because it is the only thing that that they can turn to when it comes to their four years of legacy in government. 
Things were terrible before COVID-19 in Western, in Western Australia. Things were bad. Absolutely, absolutely, Member for Kingsley, in the suburban shopping centres in your district, before COVID-19 hit, there were shops putting up for lease signs because the situation was so dire in our state. We know that right across our suburban shopping centres, up and down the, the city malls, up and down Beaufort Street in the Member for Perth and the Member for Mount Lawley's district, we know that the four lease signs were going up and that those streets and those small businesses were suffering. We know that the village centre in Kalamunda on Haines Street, with a terrible member who fails to represent his community, the shops there were closing. We know that in Joondalup, acting, uh, we know that in Joondalup, Speaker, the city centre was losing the vibrancy that once made it the great city of the north. And we know that in Mandra, before COVID-19, crime and out-of-control violence was wreaking havoc across our community. And then. And then COVID-19 came along. And then COVID-19 came along, Speaker. And that is the only thing that this government Members has been Belmont, able to point to that it has seat. managed to handle. And indeed, in, in the seat. Liberal Party, we recognise that effort of the state government. We recognise the effort of the, this government together with the National Cabinet in how they've managed to respond to COVID-19. And of course, Speaker, the Liberal Party backs in the Chief Health Officer's advice. Of course the Liberal Party wants to make sure that we look after all Western Australians so we can help keep them safe from COVID-19, help keep them safe in their communities and help keep them safe in their job. And that is the key difference, Speaker. When it comes to keeping people safe in their job, the Labor Party, this government, has no plan beyond COVID-19. We know they have no plan because when they released their, quote, our priorities sharing the prosperity documents, uh, they made a big, quite a big announcement about the fact that they had a jobs target at the time. And of course, Speaker, what we've since found is that the Labor Party's plan is best described when it comes to jobs as deferred indefinitely, because that is exactly what it reads now, as of yesterday, for the government's response, uh, for the government's our priorities sharing prosperity under their jobs target, it is now deferred indefinitely. And of course, members, what we know uh, is that that only seeks to reinforce the view in the community that this government has no plan beyond the pandemic. It has no capacity to accept that things are wrong in our state and deserve a vision and deserve a plan to help, to help ensure that we address the concerns in the community. We know, Speaker, we know that right across metropolitan Perth, right across regional Western Australia, things are not going well out there. We know. We know when it comes to local... Well, we heard, we heard today, for example, more recently, Speaker, in relation to Broome. We only know that when it comes to Broome, for example, it took an immense amount of media pressure, an immense amount of media pressure, before this government, before this government decided to do anything about it. It only seems to be the case that when there is media attention on it, when there's so much media pressure that the government actually gets around to trying to, trying to do anything. But when it, comes to act, when it comes to making sure they respond actively, when it comes to making sure that they try and give some comfort and some certainty to the people of Western Australia, they fail time and again to do so. And what do they do? Continue to talk about the past with no eye to the future whatsoever. There is a failure in this government to accept that the people of Western Australia deserve a plan for the future. They have no plan, Speaker. They have no plan. Our plan is very clear, Member for Bassendine. We will create 200,000 new jobs for the people of Western Australia as part of an ambitious target, as part of an ambitious target to make sure we return our, our economy to stronger than what it ever was before. It is important that we try and provide that certainty, that direction and that hope to the people of Western Australia from a government that leaves them with nothing but Members. despair for a lack of vision right across our state. This government is, a, is found wanting when it comes to communities right across Western Australia. Member Member Swan Swan Hills. We were in Allenbrook just a couple of days ago with the, men, with the candidates out there talking to small business owners, and we know absolutely that they are suffering in the state of Western Australia, and this government refuses. They refuse to ensure there was any safety net with a $10,000 uh, small business grant that was offered up, and that we see, that we see across Member other states and territories. Members. When you come in here, Member for so are you, Member for Swan Hills. I'll be quiet, please. I'll call your order for the first time, I think. Yes. Now, uh, you, we have a fibrillator in the chamber. Just getting very excited there, the opposition. 
Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Speaker. We know that in communities like those in your, your district, Member for Swan Hills, that they are hurting out there. And you stand, and you stand shoulder to shoulder with this government in complete ignorance for what's actually happening in your community. OK, you are on two. That makes it three, and I'm on my feet. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, because I only called you for one before. But any more behaviour like that, and you'll be going home early. Leave the opposition. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, of course, we know in Swan Hills, with a member who is desperate to try and get onto the Through front the bench, chair, please. we know within Swan Hills, with a Through member who is chair. desperate to get onto the front bench, Speaker, that she will continue to walk Through side the by chair. side, Speaker, with a government who continues to ignore this community, ignore this community, and make sure, and make sure. You might think it's funny, Leader of the Opposition, but if you want to keep baiting, I'll, I'll let the interjections come and you can talk over the top. You've only been here for a while, but you should know better than that. Thank you very much, Speaker. I can't help if some members opposite get, get excited at the prospect that one day they might try and be ministers in the last 98 days of this government. But the reality is, as long as you continue, members on the back bench of the government, to walk side by side with this cabinet who ignores your communities, you will suffer in 98 days' time. And that will be because there is a clear contrast at the upcoming state election with a party who has a plan for our economy, with a party who recognises that things could be better in our state, with a party who recognises that there should be a hope and a vision and an aspiration for the people of Western Australia, that they deserve certainty, that they deserve to be kept safe in their communities from, out, from crime skyrocketing in our regional centres and that we know before the election, before COVID-19 came along, was already already at record rates in Western Australia. We know that they deserve a plan when it comes to responding to ambulance ramping in our community. With the ambulance ramping now and the worst results, the worst records it's ever seen before, and a government who continues to fail to recognise that there was even a problem. A Premier who says that there are many different excuses for actually what is occurring in our hospitals, when in reality is a failure of this government to ensure there is funding to open up every ward and every bed in every hospital in our state. Because that is exactly the problem that is confronting our health system in Western Australia. This government has no plan. This government has no vision. It continues to talk back. It continues to talk about what has happened historically for with no vision for the future. Member for Bassett. Minister for with Water. No vision You've got a chance to talk later. And you indeed are part of that failure. You indeed are part of the failure in that cabinet because you do not try and ensure that this this government looks to the future. You talk about the past. You talk about the past. And when you release policies, they are half baked because when you are ask questions about what they look like. You can't even answer basic questions about the provision of EV uh, refuelling stations. It is ridiculous once again. It is ridiculous once again that this government continues to release these half-baked policies, rushed announcements like the Peel Health Campus upgrades, because they know in the community there is a sentiment, uh, Speaker, there is a sentiment that people want to see hope. They want to see aspiration. They want to see a plan for the future. And this government fails to deliver, Speaker. This government once again has failed the people of West Australia, and the contrast could not be clearer at the next state election. He's the Liberal Party will have a plan, him. and the Labor Party will return to business as usual. They'll continue to fail the people of West Australia. It will be the Liberals who offer the people of West Australia hope and an aspiration and a plan for the future, because the people of WA who have done the heavy lifting during COVID deserve no less. Members, members. Minister for Water, I'll outline a policy. That's your second call to order. Uh, Member for Vass. I, I rise in support of this worthy motion that's been put forward by the Leader of the Opposition and highlight the cynical business as usual politics that we've seen under the McGowan Labor government. I do this with a particular focus on regional WA because pre COVID, and, and it has been highlighted that we um, certainly support the Chief Health Officer's advice in relation to COVID-19, given that it is his advice that has um, kept WA safe. Yeah. But it is important to remember uh, some of the decisions that the McGowan government made in relation to regi regional WA before COVID-19 and when this government first came to office. In the name of uh, so-called budget repair, 
the McGowan Labor government made a decision to make cruel cuts to regional education. A cruel decision which meant that um, there would be the closure of School of the Air, that would, there, there would be the closure of 18 uh, uh, camping sites for our, um, our uh, school camping uh, locations as well, that it would see uh, the, the cutting of gifted and talented schools, or cutting of 25 per cent of, uh, from 18 schools for the gifted and talented program. 16 campsites would be closed as well, Members. and the closure of Mora Residential College. It was only because of the federal government's investment in Mora Residential College, as well as uh, a significant overwhelming campaign from the people of Western Australia, that those decisions were overturned. It was only because of the shame that was exposed by the people of Western Australia that those decisions were over overturned. Fortunately, there Member was a reason. Really call your order for the third time. And more recently, we have seen this, this lack of uh, support for regional education in relation to Derby Senior High School as well, where it, it took a community campaign to see $900,000 investment in that important senior high school, a, a high school which had significant issues regarding asbestos. Now, a broad community campaign is not the way to see important state government investment. The WA Liberals will be a government for all of Western Australia. We understand that supporting regional education and ensuring students don't have to leave their regional communities to be properly educated is a, is a real priority. We will not just be responding to bad media publicity in relation to and in, in response to making important investments in regional, edu in regional education. We will also we will also we will be, we will also deliver lower Minister, taxes. Minister, I call you order for the first time. We will, the WA Liberals will also, we will also deliver lower taxes. Call you for the second time. It, it is accepted. We, we support. Minister, Minister, I know you want to go home early, but you're not. But I call you order for the third time. We made Collie a super town. We invested. We invested. We invested. We invested. Talk through the chair, not to uh, the other side. You speak through the chair. You're getting bad habits from your leader. Million, Fifty million dollar investment in Coldfields Highway as well, under a Liberal government. What Mick. did you do? Nothing. Nothing. Mick. Uh, uh, important. Important transport infrastructure has been delivered under a federal Liberal government. It's your last warning. I, I think the cup of tea is on now. Go out and have one and then come back. <laughs> Leader. Oh, the, sorry. The, WA Liberals also, the WA Liberals also support lower taxes. Now, we agree with the, the McGowan Labor government. The McGowan Labor. Yeah, and one for you too, Mount Lawley. Okay. <laughs> The McGowan Labor government have, have, Thank you talk have certainly that, talked up um, the iron ore industry, and it's an industry we years. well and truly support. It's important to recognise that the iron ore sector has supported this state with $6 billion of investment under this term of government. But how, how about marginal mining uh, industries as well? Uh, this Labor government are also responsible for trying to uh, tax the gold industry sector not once but twice. And, and through the increase to the gold royalties, uh, an impact which would have seen a cost, according to the Chamber of Minerals and Energy, of about 3,000 jobs. Now, it was great to be out in Kalgoorlie recently with the member for Kalgoorlie uh, to visit the super pit. The, after, 31, after 31 years, uh, it's fantastic to see that the KCGM super pit is now 100 per cent Australian-owned. Yeah, under us. Thanks to the support of the Liberals and the Nationals who blocked uh, the legislation proposed by 
uh, the WA Labor government, and a, a government that's been obsessed, uh, obsessed with, with taxing the West Australian people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're on time. Okay. Um, the WA Liberals also support lo local policing. Uh, in my area, in the electorate of Bass, uh, what we have seen is youth crime intervention officers have dwindled down from the southwest region for, from four just to one. One youth crime intervention officer stretched throughout the whole region. 24 officers there were in 2017, 24 officers now. And what shame on this government that it takes a report in the West Australian to highlight uh, the issues around the uh, crime concerns in Broome. It, it takes the comments from Harold Seeley, the mayor in, uh, or the shire president in Broome, who highlighted the fact the only time that the McGowan government gives any attention to that area is when it's trying to promote their own tourism policies, as opposed to what are the real concerns around crime in this area. On agriculture, uh, quite clearly the McGowan government have dropped the ball in this area. Um, 300 workers falls well sharp, short of the 7,000 workers required to really support this industry. Uh, what we will see, and the big concern there, is the impact that that will have on fresh food prices in the lead up to Christmas. The WA Liberals also support lower pressure on household fees and charges and, uh, and, uh, and also support regional WA and our farmers as well. Uh, there's others that would like to speak, and I'll leave my comments there. Member for Mr. Speaker, I rose to speak on this motion today, and as I've often said, it it doesn't pleasure me to get up and speak on these motions. I want I, I want the same type of government that every Western Australian wants, a good government that looks after the interests of the people of Western Australia. Instead, we have to suffer through an extraordinarily cynical government that just does its typical business as usual politics and smirks arrogantly as it's doing it. And again, we saw another demonstration of it in question time today. We asked the Premier about out of control crime in Broome and why no minister had accepted the invitation of the Broome community and the Shire of Broome to go to Broome to speak at a community safety and crime forum that was being organised by the Shire. And no minister had accepted that invitation, and it was in the media, and it was causing significant um, negative media attention for the government. So the Premier quietly tells us in question time that, oh, now the Minister for Ab Aboriginal Affairs will go. OK, that's great. The, that is great. But two days ago, no minister had accepted to go. And when we challenged the Premier why it took such negative media attention to get there, he pivots, of all things, he pivots to the Hillary's primary school. That's right. Of all things. Yeah. Okay. Talking about cynicism, talking about business as usual politics, the Hillary's primary school that I've spoken in this place at least 15 times, Me it's probably about 20 times now. I think we're, you know, we, aren't we talking about something different to this? Cynical business as usual politics. OK, so you're just saying the Premier brought it out, but you uh, brought it up yourself. Up, well, I, did not, I did not bring it here today, Mr Speaker. I did not even raise it. You the just the did. Premier raised it. You just did. OK, because it's an example of cynical business as usual politics. Yeah. About 20 times I've raised it in this place now. I'd written to the Minister. I'd had significant, significant attention placed on it. It took a ceiling collapse. And even then, it wasn't included in the budget. However, one day, the Premier decides to find the road to Hillary. He's finally, uh, you know, I must have bored him witless, raising it again and again and again in this place. Finally found the road to, Hil uh, to Hillary's. But he didn't offer a financial commitment in the budget. He took out the local candidate, throwing away all convention, all convention with education ministers, and he's been an education minister and he knows if you're going to make a government announcement, if you're going to make a government announcement, you invite the local member. All, all education ministers do this as a matter of right. But it wasn't a government announcement, it was a political promise about the future. And when challenged by the media, where is this in the budget? Oh, we'll put it somewhere in the mid-year review. It's just cynical response to negative media. The police minister comes in here today and talks about a really worthy thing. That's 
Police compensation, extraordinarily worthy thing. Bipartisan commitment to, uh, to uh, police compensation. But the police compensation was promised by the same police minister, who I believe has the right intentions, the right interests at heart. The exact same promise that was mentioned made last week at the police union conference was made by the same police minister when she was lead, uh, uh, when she was shadow minister for police in the lead up to the last election. No legislation has been tabled. Again, a month and a half ago in the budget, no provision was made for it in the budget. It's really a recycling of a promise made four years ago. Unfortunately, that is cynical, but it, it follows on from other cynical announcements that have been made in the police portfolio again and again and again. We saw the need for a new police station at Fremantle. Again, it took the firebombing of police cars that can't be parked securely at Fremantle but are parked on the street. It took that firebombing and the negative media attention for the government to eventually get there. And they finally announced that they're going to build a police station, but we haven't seen it yet, and hopefully we will see it sooner rather than later that it's needed. Look at the operation that was conducted last summer in Northbridge in the CBD, and it's going to be repeated again today. After significant media um, attention that there weren't enough police in Northbridge and, and the Perth CBD, particularly at weekends, this, this government that hadn't put enough police out on the street to cope with that rising crime and rising violence in Northbridge and the uh, Perth CBD announced a policy to give more overtime to police, to ask overworked police officers to work even harder, and that's what they do, and they did it, and it's going to be done again. But it was an admission that they hadn't put enough police on the beat when they should have. It's taken until just before the next election, before the government finally announced 800 new police. And during COVID, they also announced another 150. Very welcomed by the community. But it should have been done in 2017, Premier. If you did it in 2017, you wouldn't have to play catch up now. And the community wouldn't have to suffer. And police officers who are overworked and overstretched wouldn't be asked to just do more and more and more overtime until they snap and break and leave the force and you're left in the same problem as you started. It's not good enough. It's cynical. The public of Western Australia deserve better. They deserve the safety that the Chief Health Officer can give us, that no politician can really give us, but the Chief Health Officer and following advice can, but they also deserve a better and brighter tomorrow, not a cynical tomorrow that is going to be based on what media opportunities you and your ministers can get, Premier. It's going to be based on what the public actually need at the time that they need it, not at the time that it's causing your government a problem in the media. And the sooner that the Liberal Party is returned to government and can offer that better and brighter tomorrow to people and we can throw away the cynical politics of the past, the better our community, the better all Western Australians are going to be. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The McGowan Labor government has turned its back on the community services sector like never before in the history of this state. And I'm going to use a couple, put a couple of examples on the table. On Thursday, the 26th of November, Shelter WA, the peak body representing homelessness and vulnerable people, uh, celebrated 40 years in existence uh, on that evening. And there was hundreds of people there. Uh, there was Wacos, uh, Anglicare, WA Alliance to End Homelessness. All of the member organisations were there to acknowledge 40 years of the hard work of Shelter WA. I was at that event, Mr Speaker. Not one member of the Labor Party showed up. The Minister for Housing wasn't there. The Minister for Community Services wasn't there. They couldn't even send a backbencher, Mr Speaker. That's the disdain that this government has for Shelter WA, acknowledging 40 years of working with the most vulnerable people in Western Australia, the homeless, the domestic violence victims, uh, the mental health issues, all of the uh, most vulnerable people in this state, and they could not show up to even show a little bit of respect to all of the community service organisations. We know on the 25th of November there was a rally at the front of Parliament House. Dozens of people came from 10th City out there in East Perth. First time ever in the history of this Parliament, a rally by homeless people saying, we need help. Can you give us a home? Can you give us any sort of support? Guess what? 
No one from the Labor Party could be bothered coming out to meet these people at the steps of Parliament to give them anything, any, any level of hope or support. Uh, we know when Annalise Eugle, there was a vigil out there uh, for the unfortunate uh, suicide, and we know the tragic circumstances. And even today, I talk, I talk to advocates who are working with the family out there saying they're still being ignored by this government, they're still not being given housing. Anyway, the rally was out there, we were listening to the stories. Again, no one from the Labor Party came out to face the crowd that was out there. The Liberals were out there on every single occasion. We've always been out there to support the most vulnerable people in Western Australia, unlike the Labor Party, who just talk about these things and actually do nothing about it. And we know, of course, the community services sector in December 2019 were running a campaign against this government because it had ignored the most vulnerable people in Western Australia. It ignored the community services sector and, uh, and they continue to do nothing. And all we've got from this government since they've been elected is promises to do things but they actually haven't delivered on anything. They haven't delivered housing first. They haven't delivered common ground. They haven't helped the, uh, the 10 cities are growing at an alarming rate. And I have no doubt that between now and the March election, there will be more 10 cities popping up. And like with Rockingham, like in East Perth and any other 10 city that pops up with vulnerable people, the Labor Party won't show up. They won't go there and meet them. They won't go and talk to them. I, get, I know that nobody from the Labor Party has been down to East Perth, to talk to the vulnerable people down there to see what help they need. It's absolutely appalling. I can't believe the way they have turned their back on the most vulnerable people in Western Australia and on the community services sector. They should be ashamed of themselves. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the motion be agreed to. Member for more. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to talk very uh, briefly on this this uh, matter of public interest, which has been put forward by the leader of the opposition, and I just note that it doesn't actually refer in the motion anywhere to the Nationals. Um, and I would just point out to the House and remind the House and remind the people of Western Australia that it is the regions of this state that generate the wealth of the state. And it is the Nationals that have the, the well-being and the, uh, the advancement of the people of the regions at their very forefront. So whilst uh, I may agree to some parts of the, uh, of the motion, I would point out that there is a slight deficiency because it does not refer to the most vital, the most vital element in representation of, uh, of, Na of regional Western Australia, that being the Nationals. Now today in question time, uh, Mr Speaker, I asked the Premier if he would commit to returning $2.7 billion uh, that we've seen uh, siphoned out of the Royalties for Regions program over the forward estimates. And, uh, and in spite of the rhetoric uh, that we heard about the support for the Royalties for Regions program, we know that there was no commitment. No commitment was given to the Premier uh, to restore that funding to the Royalties for Regions program. That funding is going instead to, uh, to providing for the everyday, though vital, expenditures, uh, such as the country water subs uh, subsidy, such as providing teachers' assistance, and so on and so on, uh, running national parks, etc., etc. These are important things, but they're not what Royalties for Regions was put in place for. Uh, and because of those substitutions and because there is this, uh, this ability to allow the money to flow back, if it hits a cap, uh, flow back into the Treasury's uh, coffers, uh, the government is programming in $2.7 billion of what should be being spent under the Royalties for Regions program uh, back into consolidated revenue to pay for programs, as we know, in the metropolitan area, which is, of course, the focus of the, uh, of the government at the moment. I would remind everybody in the House of Clause 4 of the Royalties for Regions Act 2009, which defines the objective of the Act as to promote and facilitate economic, business and social development in regional Western Australia through the operation of the Royalties for Regions Fund. Royalties for Regions, as a, uh, is, as a program, is a program that was developed by the National Party. Uh, the people of Western Australia in the regions know that it's the National Party which has the, the safeguarding of that program uh, at its very core. Um, we want both the city-based parties to, to outline their commitment to royalties for regions. Will they, in fact, uh, return that $2.7 billion back into the program which has been siphoned off over the forward estimates to enable the, uh, the further development of regional Western Australia? Will they focus uh, on, a regional, uh, on a regional development program uh, which is uh, not negotiable for us in forming government with anybody. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, fundamental to the Nationals that uh, the restoration of royalties for regions take place, that the full 25 per cent uh, of the program be reinvested uh, back into the regions for the benefit of the regions so that the West, West Australian people throughout the, uh, the state 
uh, can continue to, uh, to enjoy uh, hope for the future and have a, a program for their development, just like people in the Metronet area are getting in Perth. Members, the question is the motion be agreed to, Premier. Uh, yeah, clearly, the government won't be supporting the motion, um, but I just want to be clear about a range of things. Uh, one, uh, obviously, when the government came to office, we had an important program of initiatives to put in place, and that is what we have done. Uh, and uh, one of the first things we had to do was get uh, the state's finances back onto a level playing field uh, and uh, get ourselves back into a surplus position. Uh, so uh, we're the first, uh, we, we delivered the first sur surplus in years, in 2018, uh, and uh, obviously uh, that was an enormous effort to get, us, get the state back into that position whereby uh, the state was once again in surplus. Uh, by doing so, Mr Speaker, we created an environment by which we could respond uh, to the crisis that befell the state earlier this year. Uh, and had we not done that, had we not taken the steps that we took uh, in order to get the state back onto a, um, a, uh, a, a, a good financial settings or good financial position, uh, we would not have been able to respond to the crisis that befell the state earlier this year in the way that we did. Uh, and so that was a very important part of our first, uh, our first three years uh, in office, Mr Speaker, getting the state back in uh, to that position. Uh, but we did a whole range of other things, Mr Speaker, that I just want to take the House through because um, it's important that people understand there's numerous initiatives that the government has taken in a financially responsible way to ensure that Western Australia is well set up uh, for the future, Mr Speaker. Uh, I worked with uh, um, uh, Senator Cormann and uh, Prime Minister Turnbull to secure uh, G the GST deal for Western Australia. Talked about for 20 years, Mr Speaker. Talked about for 20 years. Uh, and we secured that arrangement, Mr Speaker. Now we see the Liberal government in New South Wales trying to unwind it. We see the Liberal Party, the most powerful division of the Liberal Party, trying to unwind that deal, Mr Speaker. Uh, and uh, the GST deal was very important for the future of the state. Only ever gets us to 70 cents or 75 cents uh, in, uh, uh, of uh, what we put in, Mr. Speaker. But still far better uh, than the arrangement that was put in place in uh, 1999 between the federal uh, Liberal and the state Liberal government back then. Uh, we are um, we are delivering our Metronet program. And I was out there with uh, uh, Minister Safiotti uh, this morning. Uh, with one of the important projects, uh, the Thornley Coburn Link. Massive construction going on the way, Mr Speaker. Massive construction and fixing a whole bunch of the road bottlenecks uh, through uh, that area, Mr Speaker, as I was yesterday out in the southwest in Bunbury for a huge, uh, important uh, Bun Bunbury waterfront project, again with uh, the Minister for Transport, uh, delivering infrastructure in the city and in the regions, uh, creating jobs. Uh, we, uh, we said we'd bring rail manufacturing back to Western Australia, and we have, Mr Speaker. Well Go to Midland, there it is, Mr Speaker. Opposed rail manufacturing uh, back in Western Australia, uh, opposed by the Liberal Party, opposed by the Liberal Party. No doubt uh, that will get some reference in coming months, uh, but that was an important initiative that this government uh, did. Uh, we've got $934 million we put into social and affordable housing, cut TAFE fees for 180 courses. 15 free short courses and a major investment program to do up TAFEs around the state. Undertaken, undertaken historic economic reform, historic planning reform, uh, the biggest liquor licensing reforms in 14 years, Mr Speaker. Uh, environmental um, uh, process reforms, strata reforms, on-demand transport reforms, energy reforms. We cut payroll tax, Mr Speaker. Uh, an unprecedented invest investment in defence to secure defence work uh, for our state. Uh, Mr Speaker. We secured the biggest investment in regional roads in history. Regional roads in history. Uh, and you, if you go to, uh, and we note, you know, that people are objecting to them. Uh, the National Party is actually objecting uh, to our efforts uh, in uh, regional roads, Mr Speaker. If you go to Bunbury again, the Bunbury Outer Ring Road, the Albany Ring Road, the South Coast Highway, Mr Speaker, Caratha Tom Price uh, Road, uh, all of those initiatives that we took to the Commonwealth for safety measures. Uh, on regional roads all over Western Australia that we funded, and we got Commonwealth money, and we took we took Commonwealth money that was going to be spent in the city, and we spent it in the regions, Mr. Speaker. And we think that should happen in the future as well, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the uh, defence industry, as I said, major investments in defence. Uh, obviously, an industry that had been ignored in Western Australia by the past government for years. Uh, major investment in defence, defence. 
uh, industry minister, Mr Speaker, Defence West, uh, all of the initiatives we're taking to get work into uh, Western Australia, including the Collins class submarines, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, we have a in, in relation to the public sector, a conversion to permanency program uh, for uh, people who are uh, on contracts each and every year, uh, converted to permanency and given uh, that, um, that opportunity to have secure work. Uh, and also a range of services brought back in house. I mean, you have a look at some of the prisons, Mr. Speaker. The drug rehabilitation prisons we've put in, uh, never done before, yeah. never done before anywhere in Australia. Uh, we've done it. Uh, established infrastructure WA, invest in trade WA, the LNG Jobs Task Force brought the Madagara Bridge back uh, from uh, Malaysia, Mr. Speaker, and uh, there it is, a shining example of West Australian ingenuity. We secured the Perth City deal. Out of that, Mr Speaker, you're going to see some major investment in educational and other infrastructure around the city, creating huge numbers of uh, jobs, Mr Speaker. Overhaul government procurement uh, so that uh, we maximise West Australian jobs out of government contracts, Mr Speaker. We're delivering over 1,100 new police officers for the state. Over 1,100 new police officers for Western Australia. Biggest injection of new police officers in the history uh, of the state, Mr Speaker. We kept royalties for reasons, despite the complaints and the continuing complaints uh, by the uh, National Party, Mr Speaker. Uh, we're on, doing the ongoing uh, planning for Westport. We stopped the Row 8 project, Mr Speaker. Stopped the Row 8 project. Uh, and we ensured the Commonwealth's money going into that project went into other projects around the city. And you can drive around the city and see them everywhere, Mr Speaker, in, uh, in Forestfield or in Wanneroo. And then you can go to the regions. All that money that's going to be spent in the city, regional projects as well as part of that, Mr Speaker. And we actually think regional roads are one of the most important things to save lives in regional WA. The Bustle Highway. I mean, the Bustle Highway is being duelled under this government. The Bustle Highway. Talked about forever. We're getting on and doing it. And that will save... People will not know that their life was saved by that. But it will save lives, Mr Speaker, that, that initiative. The Future Health Research Innovation Fund. Magnificent program to get more medical research and jobs into Western Australia uh, through that initiative. Uh, we reduced the number of government departments by 40 per cent, reduced the size of the SES. We introduced and stuck to a wages policy, as hard as that is, but it allowed us to get back onto a po proper positive uh, financial footing as a state. We actually brought in legislation and froze the wages of politicians in order to set an example, Mr Speaker, for four years. Politicians, judges, senior public servants, Mr Speaker. Uh, we reduced privatisations in prisons and hospitals and essential services. We've introduced a container deposit scheme out there operating as we speak. Enormously successful, enormously successful program to reduce waste uh, across the state. Banned plastic bags uh, and delivered a new museum, Mr Speaker. When it comes to legislation, voluntary assisted dying laws, the best model in Australia, the best model, and I note other states are now looking at the West Australian model. A better model than the Victorian model against all sorts of opposition, Mr Speaker. Brought it in, and I know there was people here on all sides who didn't like it, but passed important legislation that will come into effect next year and provide that relief for people in their last months of life who are dying in pain. Remove the statute of limitations for child sexual abuse. Brought in industrial manslaughter laws. No body, no parole laws. Um, sentence, increased sentences for meth traffickers. Uh, we expunge historical homosexual convictions, Mr Speaker. Reforms to dangerous sex offender laws, uh, revenge porn laws, terrorism legislation. Uh, worked with the Commonwealth to ensure that we uh, gave police the appropriate powers there. Provided medical retirement for uh, police officers, Mr Speaker, and the largest reforms to family and domestic violence uh, legislation uh, in history, Mr Speaker, amongst other things. Now, Mr Speaker, in the last two weeks, Ministers have been working. This guy, we've actually been governing. Governing. I just want to say in the last two weeks, last two weeks, I just went through my diary then, because we do so much, it's hard to remember. Last two weeks, I wanted to announce a new primary school for Hillary's, Mr Speaker. Funded. Funded in the mid-year review. Funded. So the money will be there in the mid-year review, Mr Speaker. New high, uh, primary school for Hillary's, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, and I, uh, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, you know, and I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased. Caitlin Collins worked so hard uh, for that commitment. Uh, now, Mr Speaker, um, uh, I announced at the, at the police union conference police workers' compensation. Police workers' compensation came up with a model that was agreed with the police union. So you can say, oh, you know, this was easy. This is not an easy thing to achieve. 
But not only was it agreed, but there was all the police officers there stood up and clapped, Mr Speaker, when we announced the model. All of them stood up and clapped. For the first time ever, our police will have police workers' comp. This is the last two weeks, Mr Speaker. This is just me. What I've done in terms of public announcements, ministers have done a whole range of other things as well. Police workers' compensation, Hillary's primary school, started work on the uh, Ramford Road bridge on the Thornley Coburn leak, Mr Speaker, opened the jetty road at Bunbury Outer Harbour and announced the further plans there. Uh, announced the date, and December 14, for the uh, commencement of wheel clamping legislation, Mr. Speaker. National resource management grants up in the uh, Midwest, Mr. Speaker. Had a great time up in the Midwest with Lara Dalton. What a great candidate she is, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Uh, announced our climate policy on Monday, maligned by the Liberal Party. Uh, but you know, we all know that uh, the Liberal Party doesn't think climate change is real, Mr. Speaker. Doesn't think climate change is real, Mr. Speaker. Oh. Uh, and uh, announced a uh, climate policy, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, that is practical and sensible and achievable. and does a whole range of things uh, to reduce emissions and assist people to uh, do their bit, Mr. Speaker. Announced the new Peel Health Campus, Mr. Speaker. Announced the new Peel Health Campus on the weekend in Mandurah, Mr. Speaker. The new medium density laws. Uh, the Byford Rail Program. The Minister for Transport and I were down there. Uh, announcing the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the road initiatives and the new rail uh, into Byford, Mr Speaker, again opposed by the local uh, M member for Darling Range, Mr Speaker. Uh, Operation Heat Shield, uh, expanding overtime for police officers, which uh, in my experience is welcomed by police officers. Welcomed by police officers. Uh, and it's an in initiative that we know over the hot summer months when there's more activity, uh, it works, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Minister, Minister for Lands and I and uh, the member for uh, uh, Burns Beach and the member for um, Kingsley, I think, uh, were up there announcing start of work on Ocean Reef and Marina, Mr Speaker. Massive project, huge job, job generating project, Mr Speaker. Huge job generating, job generating program, Mr. project, Mr Speaker, uh, in uh, Ocean Reef. A great, a great deal of opposition, but a great project will create enormous jobs and activity and life and vitality uh, for the northern suburbs, Mr Speaker. Uh, I, opened the, um, I opened the new museum a couple of weekends ago. The new museum, Mr Speaker. And I want to congratulate the, um, the uh, member for uh, the Minister of Culture and the Arts for all his work. I remember the meetings early on in government about the set settling on a design and funding the program, the project, Mr Speaker. Settling the design and funding the project, which we did, and we delivered it over the course of the last three years, Mr Speaker. And I must say, Mr Speaker, in terms of public buildings, I think that's the most magnificent public building in Australia, uh, which will be for all West Australians and all Australians and all international tourists to visit and enjoy. Uh, and on top of that, Mr Speaker, major TAFE upgrades, including, Mr Speaker, Beauty therapy in Mandurah, Mr. Speaker, yesterday, and the, the beauty therapists, uh, you know, the, 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 mem the member for um, the member for the member for Mandurah was there. The member for Mandurah was there. He was there. He was there, Mr. Speaker. Member for Mandurah was there. He was being pampered. He was being pampered. He was being taken care of. He was in his element. He was loving it, Mr. This is Speaker. What a guy looks like. And uh, he was there. He's looking much more youthful now, Mr. Speaker. He's having an in-depth. <laughs> he, he was having an in-depth discussion about nasal and ear hair with the uh, ladies there, uh, and he's come out looking like this, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it was uh, a terrific uh, thing. But you know, 15 million dollars worth of improvements in hospitality, cookery. Uh, beauty therapy, hairdressing and the like at Mandurah Tech, Mr Speaker. In the meantime, Mr Speaker, we've had to, over the last two weeks, announce QR codes and contact registers and how it will work and roll that out, Mr Speaker, the Minister for Health uh, and myself. Uh, and we've also had to announce details of the new control border, uh, amongst numerous other things to deal with COVID. Uh, in the meantime, Mr Speaker, the Liberal Party announces a slogan. Announces a slogan. Um, and that's it. There's no more detail. There's no more detail and there's no more policies. But the Liberal Party doesn't have detail, it doesn't have policies, it doesn't have a shadow cabinet, Mr Speaker. And we are three months to an election. So that's what I've been doing over the last two weeks. On the other hand, the Liberal Party has announced a, a one-phrase slogan with no policies underneath it and no one appointed to important positions and they've lost important members of their shadow cabinet, Mr. Speaker. Clearly, Mr. Speaker. Clearly, Mr. Speaker. Uh, clearly, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this government 
uh, will keep Western Australia safe and strong, and the Liberal Party are risky and inexperienced and not ready for government. Thank you, Premier. Uh, Minister for Transport? Or? Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I mean, it's really hard to know where to start, really, isn't West it? <laughs> I mean, I do want to quote my dear friend, the former member for Bunbury, again in this place. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. Just when you thought it couldn't get worse, here we are today. Here we are today. Now, for Hillary's. in hindsight, the member for Scarborough and the member for Netherlands weren't too bad. That's all I can say, members. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a comeback. <laughs> It, it is really hard to explain the performance today. A slogan which is a cryptic crossword. Does anyone actually understand what their slogan means? Like I said, I'm not good at cryptic crosswords, but if, can anyone actually explain to me what it means? And half an hour contribution saying that they're looking to the future. To the future. And I heard no policies. Yet again. No policies. We had the Deputy Leader of the Opposition go back to 2017. The, deputy, the Leader of the Opposition said we're going to look to the future, and all they did was look in the past. That's all they did. That's all they did. And now, members, my view is if you want the leadership, you've got to prepare for it. When my 10-year-old daughter was going for you know, student rep counsellor, and she wanted the job, and I said, well, you have to prepare for it, Grace. Preparation is everything. If you want it, you've got to prepare. You've got to know why you want it. She prepared, she got it, she executed. The Leader of the Opposition wanted the job and running the school. She did very well this morning. I won't go harp on that. But um, The Leader of the Opposition wanted the job. Eleven days since he pretty much was told by the power brokers, probably more, Probably more. Let's say 14 or 15 days, because we know under the Liberal Party those two power brokers in the upper house make the decisions. You sort of knew for about 12 or 14 days. And what have you got? <laughs> you've got a bus, you've got a hashtag, and you've got a hat. That's all you have. That's all you have. And you want to talk about cynical politics. You stand, like I said, it was like a pure, you know, I watch Veep. And sometimes it's cringeworthy, but you watch it anyway. And you feel uncomfortable, but you know what? It's just like, you know. And that's how I felt when I was coming back from Bunbury for yet another significant regional announcement. And I just watched a bit of that press conference. And it was cringeworthy, but you wanted to watch it. And you sort of saw just what a train wreck you guys are. You rock up to a shopping centre. We're going, to, we're going to make 200,000 jobs. Well, what are you going to do? Economically diverse infrastructure. <laughs> now, I don't know what that is. Economically div diversified infrastructure. I look forward to your policy on economically diversified infrastructure because I'm still not really quite sure what that, that is. And you both stood there and you said, oh, we're... We're going to make 200,000 jobs. And I heard some of the questions. You know, like, what are you going to do? Well, yeah. you know, we're going to do stuff, but it's going to be better than them. We're going to, the Liberal Party are going to spend more, tax less and charge less, and yet run surpluses. Yeah. They're going to pretend to be all things to all people. They will say anything and do anything. And the shallowness is up for there to see. And, you know, I know people come in this place and call us arrogant. But I'm glad you've got a bus for the egos of the Leader of the Opposition and the Deputy Leader of the Opposition to carry. The arrogance that you're taking already, that you are trying to sell to the Western Australian public, is breathtaking. It's breathtaking. You rock up to a shopping centre, <laughs> we're going to deliver 200,000 jobs, and we can't tell you where or how. We can't tell, but we know it's going to be better than them. It's going to be better than them. We've got to look to the future, but I'll talk. But all they've done today is talk about the past. Talk about the past. They say we don't have a plan. We've got a plan, and the plan is working. Your comments on the economy. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. What universe? Like I said, I think you're living in a parallel universe because everywhere I go, everywhere I go, it has been. You know, retail is going strong. And the numbers yesterday actually support the uh, numbers today, I think. Retail spending up 15.7 per cent compared to 2019. Spending 4.7 since March. 
We've got hospitality, cafes and restaurants. A record $321.8 million was spent at the cafes and restaurants in October. Accommodation, as we said. Has anyone tried to book accommodation um, for the next eight or nine months? It is very, very difficult. It's very, very difficult. The whole idea that somehow everyone is upset with this government is completely false. It's completely false. I mean, you have a leader... I mean, look, I, I, again, question time today. It's clear that the same person who was doing parliamentary strategy before today was doing it today. Because the questions were just as pathetic. As pathetic. And, I mean, let's, I just want to quickly highlight just some of the exciting things. Our plans are there to see. Whether it's in renewable, renewables, whether it's in manufacturing, rail car manufacturing coming to WA. An industry, a high-tech industry actually, but an industry that the opposition said was an industry from a bygone era. From a bygone era. Defence. Defence and shipbuilding. A plan to do more in WA. More in WA. Tourism. To Member for Cottesloe, you haven't made a contribution to today except interject. You know. Something about an ad in the paper. Now, I want to talk about planning reform because the opposition, the opposition says they're going to do economic reform but they can't tell us what. what when the opposition talks um, plan, um, economic reform, they talk privatisation, they talk, they talk outsourcing. That's all they do. That's all they do because they've never done anything else. They've never done anything else. So economic, what, 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 so what economic reform are you talking about? Oh, well, <laughs> you have to be saying a lot, saying a lot. So you don't know what economic reform you're going to do. Oh. Because when the opposition talk economic reform, they talk privatisation and outsourcing. That's all they do. When we talk economic reform, we talk things like planning reform. And I go to the member for Cottesloe, who opposed it, called it corrupt. That's what he did. That's what he did. So we're out there actually. And then turned up and made the road. Yeah, then turned out. <laughs> Love the cream and jam, but. Uh, drinking the. the, drinking the treasurer, shop. treasurer, treasurer. Are you in your seat? I can't tell. I can hear your drinking voice the, from that seat. Drinking the. <laughs> is drinking the champagne and eating the canapes. That's what the member for Cottesloe did. So he goes out there in the local papers, calls me, whatever. But, um, and then we've got the, the you know, leader. Member for Cottesloe. I, I really hope you become shadow treasurer. <laughs> I really do. I've got my money on you to be shadow treasurer, member for Cottesloe. So, I know my good colleague, my good friend, the member, the Minister for Health wants to contribute too. And I haven't been even able to outline Metronet and all the projects, but let's just touch on just a little bit. Forestfield Airport link, of course, um, near completion. We've got Thorny Coburn link, a project they talked about. Remember the former member for Southern River? You know? Oh, they're not. Well, they can't deliver it now because my seat's too safe. That's what the former member for Southern River said. They're not going to deliver it because my seat's too safe. Yanship, apparently, no one lives. Um, up to Yanship, says the Liberal Party. That's why they oppose it. Byford Rail, which is underway, oh, it's too hard. It's too hard. We can't deliver it, says the Liberal Party. Says the Liberal Party. And the member for Darling Range campaigning against Byford Rail. I mean, honestly, our dreams do come true, members, when the member for Darling Range is out there campaigning against Byford Rail, wanting it not to happen. Not to happen. Denny Avenue project that we're uh, delivering. The new Mandurah Rail Station um, underway. The, bell, the level crossing removal through Vic Park, again opposed by the opposition. They're out there you know, with, all, with a couple of the opponents saying, oh, look, look, it's a terrible project. It's a terrible project. Morley Ellenbrook Line, a project that the Liberal Party lied to the um, community in Ellenbrook. And I'm sure, member, I'm sure leader, leader of the opposition, opposition, when you were out there with a candidate for Swan Hills, <laughs> Is that good, my good friend Rudd Henderson? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure the community and the public were swarming to you with that. The person I think has lost 18 elections, member for Midland, is that right? 
about eight, and of course, his newfound friend, the, the candidate for Wanneroo, will be up there too. Well, Henderson's interested in a <laughs> so, better, brighter tomorrow. He is a very interested in a better, brighter tomorrow. Then for Wanneroo, you're on three treasury, so, you're not in again, your seat. I thought it couldn't get worse. It has. And we look forward. We look forward to your privatisation plan. The Liberal National Party divide and the financial mess that the Liberal National Party will deliver. The fact is, the budget is in the black under Labor. Yeah, yeah. Our economy is growing strongly. And the Premier and the Minister for Health have managed the pandemic in such a way that we have kept WA safe and strong. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker. Minister Mr. for Health. Mr Speaker, we've been criticised today for being cynics and being cynical. Well, cynicism, Mr Speaker, is the expectation that you can get into government simply by getting up and having a slogan and no policies. It's the, it's the expectation that you can underestimate the intelligence of the electorate so vastly that you can slip into government unnoticed, looking as lost as they did at yesterday's press conference in the middle of the shopping centre, believing that they can somehow slip into government without a policy. And to suggest that the process of fixing the state's finances, standing up the economy, protecting Western Australians during a global, global pandemic, and now seeing the, the economy respond and come back more strongly than before is simply a business-as-usual approach to government is, quite frankly, pathetic. The verbal diarrhoea which comes from those opposite is simply to repeat a catchphrase time and time again in the vain hope that somehow it becomes true. And it is not. The fact of the matter is, Mr Speaker, that the people of Western Australia are now enjoying a level of prosperity because we kept them safe during the global pandemic. And now, more than ever before, the people of Western Australia understand that they are on Team WA, which is the reason why, uh, Mr Speaker, the Premier and I are constantly approached by people in the community saying, don't tear down those borders. We're doing so well as a state. Let's keep it up. But the fact is, Mr Speaker, not everyone is on Team WA, because someone is on Team Palmer. Someone is on Team Palmer, Mr Speaker, and it's those opposite. We will continue to remind the people of Western Australia what you did at our time of greatest crisis, at a time when we needed everyone to be united, at a time where we needed everyone to get behind the community effort to keep us safe. Someone, starting with, the, uh, with Christian Porter and backed up by the opposition, those opposite, were trying to tear down our border, borders and undermine the very thing which makes us so successful to date. You will be reminded about that, uh, Leader of the Opposition, time and time again because that is your record. You can't escape that. You can't escape that. But what you seem to, what is even more appalling is that you're not only trying to escape your past, you're trying to elude your future. And that is, you are not coming to this place with a single idea about where you're going to take this state. You describe us as doing uh, business as usual politics. Well, if business as usual politic government is about an extra uh, 1,100 police officers, if it's, it's about uh, revolutionising our schools around STEM, if it's about the biggest transformation of our public transport system this state has ever seen, if it's about a city deal which will transform our cityscape, if it's about major redevelopment of hospitals in Bunbury, in, um, in Joondalup, in Peel, if it's, if it's about um, the uh, a digital revolution of our healthcare system, if it's about a defence industries strategy which is about creating jobs in Western Australia, if it's about bringing back rail manufacturing jobs into WA, if it's about an, an, a bright future around electronic vehicles and the Quinana big battery, if it's about a massive spend on social housing, if that's cynical business as usual government, I'll take it any day. And that's what I think you'll find the people of Western Australia will say to you. They will remember what 
what you did, you tried to do it to our borders. They, you tried to tear them down. They'll remember what you did with Clyde Palmer. You backed him all the way to the federal and the high courts. They remember how you tried to sneakily get into government without a single policy. That is cynicism. That is cynicism, and that is an insult on the people of Western Australia. We are stopping privatisation. We are reversing privatisation wherever we can find, wherever we can do so. We are creating jobs. We are providing opportunity. That is the hope that you can only aspire to, and that is the hope and the positivity that the people of Western Australia are feeding on now, because we are keeping them safe and we will keep, it, they keep this state strong. And that could only be done by the McGowan Labor government. Yeah. Thank you, members. Members, the question is, the motion be agreed to? All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? No. no. I think the noes have it. Divide. Division called, ring the bells. Is that your first divide, is it? Oh, well done. Members, the question is the motion be agreed to. Please exit the chamber and re-enter through the door behind the Speaker's chair. All those in favour, pass to the right of the chair. All those against, pass to the left of the chair. And be marked off as you pass by. Can I just hear myself speak, please? And marked off as you pass by a clerk at the clerk's table. I point the member for Belcatta for the nose. I point the member for Corrine for the eyes. Bells will ring for two minutes, but voting will continue to advise it is finished. Ring the bells. Bill. Uh, social distancing, Attorney General. Social distance. Just go. Cook. Rebel. Nice haircut, Benny. The no's have. Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, uh, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as is necessary to enable the member for Mirabuka and the member for Bateman to make valedictory speeches forthwith 
of not more than 30 minutes each. Thank you, members. Members, the question is, uh, member for Hills. Support this motion and obviously wish uh, both retiring members all the very best in the future. Uh, member, oh, uh, this is a motion without notice to suspend standing orders. Need an absolute majority in order to succeed. If I hear a dissenting voice, I will require to divide the assembly. The question is: the motion be agreed to? All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Member for Mirabuka, valedictory speech. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to give my valedictory um, uh, speech. Given the late decision not to recontest, um, there was a bit of pressure from some of my colleagues. Uh, so I feel a little bit, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, very appreciative that they've uh, made me stand up here today to say goodbye to you all. Can I uh, recognise the traditional owners on the land on which we meet? the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, their elders past and present. You know, it's with a great sense of pride that in the 12 years I've sat in this place that the First Nations people have been recognised in the Constitution. That is something that we've done while I've been here. And that that recognition um, of uh, the First Nations people and Aboriginal people now leads the opening of the House each day. I congratulate the Speaker for that legacy. That is a great legacy to be leaving uh, this place with. In government, Labor has delivered many landmark native title settlements and land use agreements. There is so much further to go in reconciling our past and truth-telling, and I thank the Noongar and ab other Aboriginal people in Mirabuka, particularly the elders such as Doolan Leisha and Walter Eats, for working with me in our area to make grassroots changes to honour the history of our country. It's been an honour and a privilege to represent the rich and diverse electorate of Mirabuka. I was lucky enough to follow in the footsteps of the late John Kabelke and Margaret Quirk, both who have been great support for me. But along with many other members of parliament who have also been great support and inspiration for how I undertook the most privileged job in my life. The Mirabuka electorate reflects the multi-faith, varied national and cultural heritage that has always made up the story of settlement in Australia. Australia reflects our globalised world interconnected not just through technology but people. Globalisation cannot be just about trade. The diaspora in Australia want an effective avenue to contribute to Australian foreign policy and policy in Australia, particularly where there are injustices and conflict in their country of origin. For example, the Indian community, particularly the Sikh community I've worked with, want to be able to voice their concerns regarding the impact on Indian farmers of recent legislative changes. They are concerned that given 86 per cent of Indian farmland is held by smallholder farms owning less than two hectares, the protections of their standard of living is at risk and will be subject to predatory co corporatisation with the removal of minimum price. We all know that we like minimum wages. We all think that that's an important thing and we need to uphold that throughout the world. It's with this in mind I commend the Economics and Industry Standing Committee Report 10, Turning to India, Investing in Our Future and Recommendation 6 which includes active engagement of the Indian diaspora, and, and I urge a future state government to adopt their recommendations, not just for India, but for other communities as well. With some 52 per cent born overseas and 60 per cent speaking a language other than English in their home, Mirabuka constituents paint a picture of modern Australia. Based on the ABC 2009 Australia Talk survey, the key element of being Australian was in respecting institution and laws. It's clear to me that for those both born in Australia and who come here as migrants, be it skilled or students or seeking refuge, that they want the right to belong, to be treated equally by the laws and those government institutions that uphold them. In sharing democratic beliefs, respecting rights and liberties and upholding and obeying laws, the pledge by it made at citizenship, all Australians seek a life of dignity and pride, one without prejudice based on race and religion. The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly reinforced a catchphrase, we're all in this together, which is similar to, be, to the saying, a fair go for all. But for that to be a reality, it needs to be reflected in our institutions and in our leadership with support and commitment. In particular, it needs to be reflected in our equal opportunity legislation, which as it was done in 1984, 
the legislation no longer reflects what is needed to ensure our community responds to discrimination, in particular racism and intolerance. On a positive note, the multicultural framework introduced this year based on the Multicultural Charter is a document that I am proud to have worked with, on the, with the Multicultural Advisory Group on. Of particular note is the great work of Sayad Pachar, Maria Osman, Iqbal Samnake, Yang Zee or Edward, and Helen Maddox. While COVID-19 has delayed some of this great work, I urge all government departments to embrace this framework as a guide to the innovation that diversity will bring to our institutions. Certainly, that success is the experience of Kaleidoscope, the newcomer workplace participation um, and, uh, program. And the participants and employers have both had great experiences. It's another great initiative I was honoured to be a part of, and I thank the City of Stirling for its innovation. I truly want to thank all the people of the electorate of Mirabuka, those that live there, those that work there or have lived there, all who have been embraced by the spirit of the place in their hearts, including myself. And I sing the praises of an area steeped in culture and celebration, from Harmony to Eid, Songkran, Tet, Nadoc, and Karen and Chin New Year. I used to say my New Year started in September with Persian New Year and finished you know, at Songkran uh, with uh, the Thais in April. Um, a great way to have New Year's resolutions when it's only for six months. <laughs> it was with pride I saw the Kundula Community Centre built to cater for the large and cohesive Vietnamese seniors group and opening at the West Nam Sporting Centre where the love of soccer sees all the different communities in the area play alongside each other. There are so many landmarks to mark my 12 years. The Reed Highway Bridge, the Princess Road Park upgrade, the development of the land around Mirabuka, including, including Maya Vista Nursing Home, and the establishment of the Wadjuk Northside Aboriginal Resource Centre. But these are the built form that do not demonstrate the pride in the area, a pride strongly defended. So when some seven or eight years ago, the front page of the Daily News screamed fear of young African Australian men, the community stood strongly against the stereotypes that misrepresented the good work of so many young Australians. In indeed, the defence went so far as to take the matter to the Press Council and seek redress to highlight the leadership of young African Australians. These Australians with African heritage, like Ayo Makua Chuot, who is the number three Labor candidate in the North Metropolitan, demonstrate the strength of the community to rise above the prejudice and adversity that unfairly confronts them. And I look forward to seeing her be in the, in the other house in the, following the next election. One of the biggest issues that confronts all of Mirabuka community is employment opportunities. From the high of 25% unemployment that we saw under the Barnett government, the residents of Mirabuka have seen a decline in March 2020 to 19.1%, which is comforting given the circumstances, but not enough. The impact of the federal government's changes to JobKeeper and JobSeeker will have a detrimental effect on the community in Mirabuka, and I would urge the WA government to continue to lobby for unemployment benefits which reflect the cost of living of the people in Western Australia. What we have learnt through COVID is that decisiveness is valued by our community and expected by our leaders. We politicians have appreciated the respect of our community and worked with them to ensure both their physical and mental health needs have been met. Throughout my 12 years, but particularly this year, it's been an honour to work with the local councils in my area and their staff at the City of Stirling and Wanneroo. I particularly want to thank the local councillors I worked with, David Boothman, Keith Sargent, Hugh Newen, Dominic Zappa, Vin Newen, Brett Treby, both the mayors and other mayors, and the past councillors, including Arne Trung. There is never one reason for making a decision to leave your job, but even though I may change my title, I will not change the thing that drives me and makes me passionate about seeing a more inclusive, fair and equitable Australia. But as the, saying going, goes, as the saying goes, meaning and hope are as important to a human being as bones. This role representing the people in our Mirabuka community has given me that and more. In the parliament, the opportunity to be on parliamentary committees and in particular the chair of the Education and Health Committee has been a highlight. I've achieved many things in this place, both in opposition and in government. I got to work in the second chamber on pivotal health legislation on which we now rely and the changes in the vocational education training in schools from an inquiry which I chaired. I'm proud that this government delivered on the FIFO report I worked on and established an all-health and safety code of practice for mentally healthy workplaces with a view to prevent self-harm and suicide. 
I was privileged to work alongside the member for Kimberley as we investigated the tragedy of Aboriginal youth suicides to produce recommendations in the Learnings from the Message Stick report and welcome the state and federal governments closing the gap commitments to build the community controlled sector critical develop to developing appropriate and effective services. It is important to have those community sectors, those community organisations deliver on the ground to the people in need. I am so passionate about the Food Fix report and the need to address the epidemic that is type 2 diabetes in our community, a disease which costs the peop people their lives and health some 10 per cent of their budget and increasing. This is, a disease, this is a disease that can be put into remission and the health authority's lack of action is questionable. Give people the hope they need, work with primary providers and meet the challenge with proactive and resourced responses such as those in the recommendations of the report. I urge the government to do this. Thanks to all the committee staff that worked with me over the years, not forgetting my three years on delegated legislation and our good work around fees and charges and Australian standards. To the SPLP staff, the MPs in the, uh, the electorate office staff in other members' offices, all who I've worked with over the 12 years, thank you. To the ministerial staff who, in both Liberal and Labor governments, have been respectful and helpful. To the many public servants I have worked with, thank you for your dedication and commitment to our WA community. To all the staff of the parliament, both on the front line and in HR and IT, including DPC, thank you. Please accept my thanks. You've always been respect respectful and helpful, despite my naughtiness at times. And I can be a bit naughty at times. Your willingness to stop and share your personal stories with me has made the time in this building rich and fun. Thanks to those who were endlessly patient, like reception, those who listened and corrected my speeches, like Hansard, the clerks and the chamber staff that let me challenge them when I was in the chair. It was always fun to grab out the green book <laughs> and question what I was being told. Uh, thanks to the library for your acceptance of my continual requests for articles and books the catering staff for the tolerance of my eating habits, to those who run the parliament, I get it's difficult and your concern is the staff and safety is a core commitment. I acknowledge and thank you, but it is a house of the people, the common house, and those people include parliamentarians. The building should be a welcoming place and over the 12 years I've been here, I fear that has been undermined by other priorities, maybe no less worthy, but without commitment to a core value of making us, the MPs, feel like we fully belong. I commend the decision to have a family room, but it needs to be more than a room. It has to be inclusive, accepting, tolerant of inconvenience, tolerant of inconvenience and most of all, give a sense of belonging. With respect to Parliament, when anyone questions the value of targets for women in Parliament, you will have to question the value of my contribution, as I am proudly the result of many women and supportive men ensuring women like me stand in this place. And one of them is in the gallery today with Helen Cree. I came to this place as a result of the Labor Party commitment to affirmative action. As I've demonstrated here and in the electorate, I have merit. Some bloke with greater capacity was not overlooked because the party gave me, as a woman, preference through targets. If you're a woman who wants to follow your passion and seek to change the delivery of services into the community or introduce new innovations, my standing here tells you that you can too. Well, at least you can if you're a member of the Labor Party. <laughs> Bateman will be interesting. <laughs> to take on this job, you need support from your colleagues, volunteers and community, but most importantly from your family and friends. Thanks to the Freedom Girls, the Emily's List crew, the Yoga Mob, the Neighbours, all my volunteers and supporters, too many to name individually. Thank you all. Thanks to the community who I've represented and the NGOs, all fantastic people to work for. Thanks to my family. Now I'm going to cry. Thanks to my family. It's been a hard year, but we've loved each other and supported each other through it. To Jodie, Nathan, Tracy and Ken, you are amazing. I love and cherish you all. To my mum, throughout my 12 years, you've taught me resilience and reliability, a strength of character that served us so well in this tough year. 
You've also taught me that I have to deal with my anxiety, um, which is also a very good uh, uh, lesson to learn. You know, I couldn't imagine running for re-election without my biggest supporter, and also my greatest critic, my dad. So now, I guess I won't have to. <clears throat> to my lovely radical son, he runs a close second in the questioning my belief stakes. He keeps me questioning. His arguments are pretty convincing. Can I just tell you, the woman's revolution of the 70s produced me. So I am so looking forward to what the social revolution of this time, of this age, produces as the leadership of the future. I can imagine that that future won't be captured by a laissez-faire capitalism of privatisation and small government that I was taught at uni that it will embrace the health and well-being of its citizens. I'm heartened that my belief that the wealth of, wealth of a nation is built on the public ownership of its facilities, delivery, delivery of universal health and education, importance of stimulating the economy for employment, and a compassionate welfare system has borne fruit in this time of pandemic and is something that we should all be committed to. I trust that a future Labor government will continue to ensure that the wealth that is quarried from the West Australian earth will profit all West Australians, not a few, both in ensuring Aboriginal heritage and culture preservation, and that the community of WA receives commensurate amount for the wealth of the resources extracted. This health crisis is only a precursor to the urgent need to address climate change, and I came into this place calling for a carbon price. That has been such a vexed issue, but we need to resolve it. I welcome the government's recently released climate change policy and the commitment to net zero emissions by 2050. I am sure that this commitment will have a plan and goals to meet that, uh, to meet that process to get there, to ensure we deliver on this urgent issue. I welcome the health, committee's, uh, health commitments released today and uh, commend the Minister and Taryn Wiramathi for the great work um, around looking at climate change and the impact on the health of our community. And he came to our community to ask for uh, input from uh, the coal community around that. And it was a great contribution that we received. And uh, you know, he's a great uh, um, uh, asset to our community. But back to my thank yous. To my best friend in parliament, Roger Cook. Your emotional intelligence makes you an exceptional human being and just a joy to be around. Uh, I can go dancing now without worry. You'll have to wait until you get your time to do your valentictory until you can join me on the dance floor in a nightclub. <laughs> to my other parliamentary colleagues, I will miss you all. My first caucus meeting in this place was as the president of caucus. I sat before you as president of caucus before I'd even sat in caucus. <laughs> And you have all shown me, well, mostly all show me, <laughs> such respect and regard. And it's also, you've all shown me why being in the Labor caucus is the greatest honour a political tragic like me can have. To the Premier, Mark McGowan, it's been an honour and a privilege to be part of your team. You never fail to acknowledge me in any setting. That simple hygiene, whether you were rushing into a meeting or in deep concerns, is a great testament to your unpretentiousness your capacity to be a leader and be one of us. Uh, and also, thanks for letting me burst into your office at any time, especially when Julia Gillard was visiting so that I could say hello. <laughs> that was exciting. Um, to my union friends, particularly Carolyn Smith and all others, thank you for always keeping it real, for appreciating my work and for listening to my concerns. To my staff, particularly uh, Sue and Donata, who actually managed to stay with me through a campaign and beyond, thanks. To Razia, thanks for coming back to save the day. To all the others who've contributed in my staff, it's just been a real honour to work with you. And I thank you for putting up with sometimes my bluntness and my, uh, uh, you know, sometimes off-handed comments. <laughs> to all of the Nolamara branch members and volunteers, especially Amy, Robic, Robert, Eric, Harry, Kayende, Raphael, Hiba, Nick, Sonata, and anyone I've forgotten, because you always do, um, and all the booth captains and the workers, thanks for the support. The job is not able to be done without you. You've all been fantastic. To Danny, thanks for your wisdom and guidance. To Shani, thank you for your support these last months. To my friend Elizabeth, thank you for being with me on an, an enormous long journey since uh, university. 
To my partner, John, I'm not sure whether the last 12 years have been hard on us or kind, but we have loved each other through it and prevailed. I cherish your support and thank you for your no-nonsense non guidance. You're kind and patient and loving, and I love you and Thomas very much. So, I could keep going. Oh my God, it's only, <laughs> I realise, but you know, it is Friday afternoon. Uh, but I do want to say this in conclusion. I came into this place saying I'm a feminist. That didn't mean I was up for a fight or I just wanted to change the use of language, although I did win on the taking out the man out of chairman when we used to sit in uh, estimates. That used to be me turning it around every time someone would go and print a new one and scrubbing it out again and putting it back. But it didn't mean that. That's not why I came here, to do those, those things. It's, you know, those little things matter because, you know, frankly, they're like fingernails down a blackboard when you're a feminist, but they're not the things I came. It meant I wanted to see change to make women's lives better and deliver equality. I wanted to see women represented in this parliament. And I have really cherished this parliament in 2017, um, uh, uh, you know, since 2017, with all the women colleagues that I've had in this parliament. The change I worked for was like that delivered by Edith Cowan, one of significance. Next year, it's 100 years since she was elected to this place in any Commonwealth Parliament. This should be honoured by ensuring that next year we have the first woman speaker of the WA Legislative Assembly. The same house that Cat called and jeered 100 years ago when the first woman stood to speak, it seems to me a historical moment too good to miss to deliver that the person who sits in the chair at the centre of the chamber should also be a woman. Further, women have done it tough over COVID and focus on early childhood education and occupational opportunities need to be the focus in the coming government, a focus that a commitment to a woman's budget would deliver. It's been an honour and privilege to be here. It's, uh, um, I could go on and on and talk about all of the many memories I have in this place. Now that I've spoken, I could keep going. I got really good at being able to uh, speak at the drop of the hat. The whip tells me when I told him I was leaving uh, who am I going to get to just, when I say, you need to speak on this uh, to get up? Can I say, when I first came to this house, I hated public speaking. I used to get up and be really nervous and very um, reticent. I felt like you had to know so much to be here. I felt like you could, yeah, that's right. <laughs> And I, you know, I never wanted to let the people of Mirabooka down either in terms of what I would say or end up on the front page of the newspaper saying something that, you know, I want to say things that can be a bit off the cuff sometime and a bit, uh, a bit cheeky. Um, but it has been, a, you know, people have always listened to me um, and given me respect. A few times, maybe not, there was one incident I can remember uh, that, uh, um, you know, I felt that I was uh, um, disrespected in this chamber. But for me, when you stand with a lot of women next to you in this house, it makes you feel like this place is a place for you and it makes you feel like it's easier to speak. Um, it can be a really odd chamber, you know, standing across. It's very adversarial. I don't think it needs to be like that. I think, you know, I've talked about the second chamber that we did to the health, with the health legislation. Um, just back here in the, in the committee room, um, and how that was such a different experience as a member of parliament, how we were able to get really into detail and directly speak to the advisers in a manner that actually brought a, a great piece of legislation, um, delivered a better piece of legislation that came to this parliament, and both uh, we were in opposition doing that, and you know the minister um, uh, you know, said that himself as he stood up here in the third reading speech at the time. Um, so, you know, reform is needed in this place to make it a more welcoming, a more inclusive. It certainly needs to probably be more multicultural. We need, that's a, that's a challenge for the Labor Party about how we uh, um, bring people from a diverse set of backgrounds. Um, yes, okay. <laughs> there are people who could do that on this side as well, remember for Hillary's, but yes. Um, but it has been an honour and a privilege, and I've really uh, cherished it. I'm looking forward to uh, what happens after the uh, um, uh, 13th of March, 
Um, I'm looking forward to seeing another WA Labor government. I believe that they've done such a good job that they should be returned to government. I'm looking forward to Meredith Hammett being the member for uh, uh, Mirabuka, although um, she has to still go through the Labor Party processes. <laughs> but she's got my support, just in case anyone wants to know. Um, <laughs> and I thank you all for having me and having me uh, in this parliament. Thank you. So, could everyone move out for the next group to come in, please? Thank you. Member for Bateman. Mr. Speaker, firstly, I'd like to thank my colleagues for allowing me the opportunity for a valedictory uh, speech. Um, and I'd like to open by saying that I've developed a greater appreciation of and respect for the importance of Parliament. The opportunity to make a difference in people's lives is the most rewarding aspect. The opportunity to walk in Dad's and Granddad's footsteps has been a privilege. But the challenge to deliver meaningful outcomes at times can be extremely frustrating, as all of us know. To serve as a Minister of the Crown is something I'll never forget, and making the decision to move on in my family, uh, family's best interest has caused me to reflect on some of the highs and lows over my journey. As a Minister of the Crown, uh, the opportunity to influence and be involved in so many wonderful projects for Western Australia, uh, completing the gateway and opening it, uh, the Tonkin Highway upgrade with the uh, Prime Minister, uh, the planning, coordinating and contracting and starting the Forestfoot Airport link, the redesigning, the contracting and commencing of the North Link. There are some stories behind some of these things that I find interesting and, and probably have never been told, but uh, just as a small anecdote and to share with people here, um, when, we, uh, when we first had the design put in front of me, it was actually a dual freeway through to Ellenbrook and then a single lane with traffic lights all the way through to uh, Brand Highway. And I sat there and looked at this and went, surely this is going to fail the moment we start with trucks moving through this heavy route. And uh, they said, yes, it will. And I said, well, we've got to do it properly. We've got to work out how. And it was interesting. We broke the project into three components instead of two. And, and we went out to tenders and we did all of this work. And we, we managed to actually duel it and uh, overpasses all the way and connecting it. It was only after that point I discovered that uh, here I'm thinking I'm doing a fantastic job. And I discovered it was Main Road's original plan. <laughs> And um, my, my previous boss had decided it was too big and cut it back. And unbeknownst to me, I was going against my boss's wishes, having been a new minister, and actually had it redesigned to what I thought was doing it properly. And, and uh, I'm glad that I actually got that through. And, and uh, Colin never actually stopped me on the way through. I was really pleased about that. Uh, but you know, overseeing the uh, development of the bus underground, but again, looking through that and working with the departments, they were really proactive and uh, we identified some inefficiencies and we actually uh, built the second entrance into the design off Wellington Street. We actually included a design to put the uh, Charles Street bus bridge because there was going to be a thousand buses a day heading north off Wellington into Northbridge that was going to add about six to seven minutes through peak time and we could save that uh, for up to a thousand buses a day by spending another 30 million uh, getting that bus bridge. Uh, there was um, uh, the extending the Joondalup rail through to Butler, the Mitchell Freeway extension to Hester. There were a large number of projects uh, in uh, the Department of Transport in my time as Minister, and it was a real privilege to undertake that. 
uh, but a piece of work that I, um, I, I did initiate, and uh, I'm sort of regret some ways that it's, it's been a little bit lost at the moment. Um, I, I came in and felt that uh, one of the problems that I had was that we went from election to election, uh, and often, irrespective of which side you sit, uh, we had our favourite projects, and for me there hadn't been long-term planning uh, in Parliament for, uh, for transport for decades. And really the Stevenson, the Stevenson plan from the 50s and 60s was the last time that Western Australia undertook long-term uh, transport planning. And given the Perth and Peel planning document had just been completed, I requested that the Department of Transport actually undertake the equivalent Perth and Peel transport plan. But I did ask them not to base it on a time period, because we know that population growth ebbs and flows, and I'd rather do it based on uh, the population uh, rather than a, a set time. And so we, we talked about it being towards you know, three and a half million people and beyond. And uh, it was work that I instructed the department to undertake without the Liberal Party's involvement. But I will admit I did interfere with two little things in there, but I'll come back to that. But the whole point of this was that I really wanted some document that actually provided a roadmap that it involved the department, it involved academics, it involved the universities um, and industry to actually prepare a transport plan for the long term for Western Australia as it continues to grow. And I was really pleased with uh, what we, we did achieve, and I have shared it quietly before, I think, but uh, there were two aspects that I did add into it that I thought I had to take the politics out. Um, one of them was that it didn't actually have the, the line that went up, um, uh, up Tonkin Highway, uh, didn't cut into Ellenbrook. It actually kept going up and then swung back around onto the Joondalup line. And I felt that politically I needed to make sure I had that connection, otherwise it was going to be a bit like uh, Rockingham that's not quite getting into Rockingham or Mandra, doesn't quite get into Mandra. And so I wanted to make sure that was there. But the other one was I think that as a city that's going to grow towards three and four or five million people, every city in the world that I see that operates really efficiently and effectively from a transport plan actually has greater connectivity uh, with rapid transport solutions. And so I felt that it needed to have an underground rail loop and a population that is uh, moving to three and a half million and, and beyond. And uh, so they were the two, two areas that I did uh, have some say. But in working through all of this, I wanted to do more. And uh, the Premier used to regularly say to me that when I took new initiatives to him that I was doing too much already. Uh, my message to all ministers uh, is it's not a long time. Uh, work smart and go hard. And I say that for everybody in this. It's amazing that when you're in the middle of it, it feels like it's for, going to be forever. And what I can say is that it's gone like that. And if you don't grab that opportunity and just go hard, do what we can for Western Australia while you have that opportunity, I do encourage that. There are a few projects that um, I did uh, deal with or try to work on, and I'll share some of them because um, people might not be aware. Inheriting uh, the, the construction work at Elizabeth Quay, I looked at it from a transport perspective and I was of the view that we had to connect Riverside Drive underneath. And there were estimates that have been taken by Troy Buswell earlier that suggested it might cost within, you know, towards 300 million. And I wanted to look at it. So I actually had formal quotes uh, um, developed and uh, took, took the options to the Premier. I took three different options. One was a full freeway connection to Riverside, so it connected so you didn't end up on Mounts Bay or the Esplanade and all that traffic jam snarl and people trying to move through that area. Um, a full freeway connection, I did it where it was stoplights either end, and I did it where we just put the infrastructure in, so the, the walls and the diaphragm that could be dug out at a later point. Uh, it was $150 million for the full freeway, it was $90 million if we did it with stoplights, it was $26 million if I put the infrastructure for a future government to actually undertake it. I actually took the recommendation, my recommendation was let's put the infrastructure in. If we can all, you know, it's there, it's only an extra 26 million. Unfortunately, it, wouldn't, it wasn't approved, uh, and it's something that I felt should have been done um, that hasn't been done. Uh, there's other things that um, were, were brought to me uh, by uh, industry. One of them, which I thought uh, sounded fantastic, and, and when we've looked at um, value capture, and I know the current government's explored value capture and struggled with it, but I had uh, industry bring a proposal to us to consider, which was actually dropping Stirling Highway, uh, the railway line and Curtin Avenue between Cottesloe and North Fremantle uh, for the air rights to be able to develop above that. And um, I actually had a look at what they proposed and I thought it was fantastic. Uh, but uh, again, Colin kept telling me, Dean, you're doing too much. Uh, I had a proposal brought to me that uh, to do residential development over the freeway and over the railway line uh, at Canning Bridge. 
Um, and, to, and for me, that would quieten that whole precinct down around there, and I thought that was a fantastic initiative. Uh, but unfortunately, again, when I said to the developers, well, what I want is the southbound um, entry off Manning Road, I also want a bus interchange, um, and I was hoping to get some state infrastructure done uh, at the same time. Uh, but alas, I was doing too much. Um, there was also uh, the Row 9 tunnel. Now, this one was actually an interesting piece of work because I did inherit um, the upgrading of the uh, High Street and uh, the consideration of Row 8. And I, I, I said to Matthias Corman at the time that that's leaving Stock Road as a problem. And that's where the whole freight link design came in, where Stock Road. But I never felt comfortable with it because it was really going to impact on commercial businesses. It was going to take out Dasonia. It was going to take out Koala Storage, the brewery. Um, there were going to be massive impacts for those guys, but it was going to impact on the cemetery and impact certain residences uh, that I felt we should be able to do something smarter and better. And I did ask the Department of Transport to actually undertake uh, a series of work, and they spent 12 months on this, and they, they looked at 22 different options to actually create a better uh, solution. And their recommendation coming back was, the, was a tunnel option. And what was fascinating, I was sitting there quite cynical about tunnelling at this point in time, and I was getting a bit of criticism about Forestford Airport Line that we were going to do a tunnel uh, for a railway line. And uh, it was fascinating because uh, we thought that it would cost an additional $700 million uh, but would save $400 million in property acquisition costs. And uh, uh, when we went to the federal government, we looked at the business, uh, the benefit cost ratio. We believed that it was a similar benefit cost. It was a shorter distance to the Fremantle port. I went to the federal government. They supported it. When we went out to tender, that tender for doing the tunnel for row nine came in cheaper than upgrading High Street and Stock Road. And that shocked me. It was the same thing. When we went to tender on the, uh, the uh, Forestwood Airport line, we actually allowed $2 billion budget for the Forestwood Airport line. Um, and uh, uh, it came in, the contract or the tender came in at under a $1 billion. We since did some improvements that spent a bit more to allow us in project management and, and a few other um, uh, costs. Uh, there was still a massive saving. It was, it was actually cheaper than taking the rail line down that uh, the Tonkin Highway or Row Highway and in, in through Horry Miller Drive. And all of a sudden I'm seeing that there is a p potential with technology that we can actually start to go under the city uh, cheaper than what we can above. And a lot of that is because relocation or purchasing of uh, properties or the property acquisition or the relocation of services. And I do see that as an opportunity for future governments to explore where we can have less interruption uh, with the local community by removing and creating throughput uh, in our communities. Um, sometimes it can be the little things, and I don't know, I keep saying member for Gosnells or member for Thornley, but it's Gosnells, isn't it? Um, he and I, a couple of years ago, we were sort of uh, having, we were, we were trying to inspire each other to, to work a little bit harder on our fitness, and, and the two of us actually uh, completed over 20,000 kilometres on our, our push bikes in, in 2018. Um, it nearly killed me, but uh, I really thank him for that. But, um, one of the things we all do when we're riding is we've got Strava on our bikes and um, there's a, there's a, heading on the, the northbound on the Row Highway, there's a, um, the pedestrian bridge or the cycle bridge over Welshpool Road. It's got the Dean Nolder Bridge. I've, I'm never not sure who set that up on Strava. I wasn't sure if it was the member, um, but uh, I felt very privileged. But there is a little story behind that. Um, when we were starting the Freightlink, people might think that Freightlink was killed off, but actually part of Freightlink was upgrading Row Highway from Tonkin Highway down to Welshpool Road. And that included an additional three kilometres of um, um, uh, uh, cycle pathing. And uh, I had, well, this is where people don't get recognised and rewarded, because I've been given the credit on making sure that this connected up. Um, but what had actually happened, and I won't ever mention their name, but um, for their sake, but uh, someone in the department, junior in the department, quietly rang me up and said, if you had a look at the design for uh, Freightlink, and I said, what do you mean? He said, have a look at the cycle path. And I go, what do you mean? He said, it stops at Welshpool Road. So when I, I had to feign as though I, I had no idea and I asked to see the designs on, you know, because I just wanted to check them off. And I said, where's this cycle path? And they went, oh, it stops. And I said, well, we had 24 kilometres of uh, freeway grade cycle path all around the airport and Tonkin Highway and everything else like that. And there was this 50 metres where they were going to have to stop at a set of lights. 
And uh, they said, oh, this will cost $4 million. So you can't do it. We, we haven't got the budget. And I said, I, look, let me tell you, politically, I'm going to get more grief over this 50 metres than I'll get benefit over the pre other 24 kilometres. And they agreed and found a way, and hence the cycle bridge. Now, I'm getting credit for it, but the reality is it was someone quietly letting me know that there was something... Because we these things can happen to all of us on both sides, that you're actually undertaking work. You might not have seen this gap and until it's too late, and then you're left with something that's not been done properly. And uh, so I'm really thankful, and I'll t I've told that person privately since, uh, we share a birthday not too far apart, so we do wish each other a birth happy birthday every year. Um, but there's, there's things like, the, as I said, the Charles Street Bridge. To save 1,000 buses, five, you know, well, off peak it was about four or five minutes, on peak it was about six or seven minutes saved. So 1,000 buses a day where you're saving four to seven minutes, that's quite a big saving uh, for the bus fleet for a $33 million cost. Um, but there have also been some challenges as a, uh, in that time uh, as a minister. Uh, I, was, I was stuck in the middle of uh, Uber entering Perth. And uh, what a nightmare. It was fascinating. I, I, had, uh, I heard on 6PR yesterday morning, I think it was yesterday or the day before, uh, someone rang in and said, I destroyed the taxi industry. Dean Nolder destroyed the taxi industry. And Millsy said, well, some people suggest that he revolutionised it. And I sat there going, the reality is this thing happened all around me. And uh, I was stuck in the middle of it. It was, um, it was a challenging time. Uh, I was on the, of the opinion that the, um, the taxi industry needed reform. I don't believe that the service offering was satisfactory. I don't believe that uh, enough of the revenue that was generated in the industry was flowing through to drivers and the operators of vehicles. Uh, and I was quite happy to try and do a reform. But then Uber just came in and smashed the place uh, at the same time and did, left it, made it very difficult. We were fortunate in Western Australia because the largest, the largest owner of taxis in Western Australia, a lot of people didn't realise this, was actually the state government. And we were one of the only governments that actually owned. We owned close to 50 per cent of the place. So the biggest loser in the taxi industry was actually the people of Western Australia as they're owning it. But the people of Western Australia wanted to see uh, this level of change. And, uh, but that allowed us to pull some of those uh, lease plates off the market uh, to ensure, as the, as the number of fares were dropping, we could actually ensure that there was a competitive marketplace for the existing taxi service. They were the challenges. There was also uh, inheriting uh, the deferral of Max Light Rail. Uh, and obviously the row eight challenges. I will share with you, I mean, we're sitting there as a minister and I get a phone call from the Premier's office and he goes, uh, Dean, uh, uh, the Premier wants to see you down at row eight now for a press, press uh, a doorstop with the press. And I'm going, but, but the, 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 all the protesters are there. And he, go, he goes, yeah, that's what Colin wants to do. He wants to go down there. I go, oh, street. So we've gone down to row eight and all the protesters are there. DPU are, su are surrounding us as we walk through the middle of them. I'm going, oh, God. So I'm standing behind the Premier looking all, you know, supportive, ready to run. But um, it was funny. We've got the DPU guys sitting next to us and uh, Colin's trying to give a give a doorstop, you know, with all the cameras, and they're shouting and screaming. And uh, I'm sitting there going, what are we doing? At that time, I'm getting whacked on the head with these flagpoles um, from these protesters, and DPU threatening to arrest them, and I'm just, oh. It was, it was an interesting experience that I had, but uh, Colin thought that was fantastic. As I'm sitting there just going, this is crazy. But um, it was an interesting experience, and certainly a challenge uh, that I found. One of the things that I, um, I worked on, uh, it was also, and, it, and it, I've never agreed and don't support tolls. I think we're lucky in Western Australia that we don't have toll roads. Uh, but one of the things that I was looking at and trying to work out how do we solve this is actually um, rapidly advance uh, freight movement uh, throughout the, the metropolitan area. And I went to Singapore, had a look and talked to those guys and was trying to work out ways that we could do it. And this is where I think some, sometimes the, the, the term freight charge and what I was trying to explore there gets lost in the politics. Um, and one of the promises that I made to industry at the time regarding a freight charge, and I'll come back to what it meant, but was that um, the, uh, if we could find a way where we could share productivity gains, where they could actually in, uh, pocket more than 50% of the increased profit as a result of new infrastructure and use less than 50% to help fund the infrastructure, we could rapidly advance a, a freight freeway network right around the metropolitan area. And one of the promises that I made to industry at the time is, if they don't agree with it, I wouldn't proceed. And so that's where I was starting to explore. And because of the politics, this has been lost. And to me, they, they'll still want to have a freeway and for free and everything else like that. But the reality is, we only get bits and pieces done over a very long period of time. 
And I, for me, was trying to find ways that we could rapidly advance and improve the underlying profit uh, to industry that ultimately flows through for cost of goods and uh, to the cost of products on, on the shelves in, in the market. So um, they were things that I haven't been able to achieve. I would say um, uh, in thinking uh, about what, what I would like to say tonight, I didn't, all, I didn't want to just look at what's happened in the past. I wanted to sort of think forward and uh, how I observe what state governments are doing and, and how I think about it. For me, I look at uh, the state government along the following lines, economically, socially, environmentally and administratively. They're to me the major strategic elements. Uh, as the shadow treasurer, I, I've been focused on the economic drivers and the administration of the state government. From an economic perspective, for me, we must, in Western Australia, attract industry and ensure WA businesses can compete effectively both nationally and internationally. The state government plays a critical role and must ensure cheap energy in addition to reliable and sustainable. Uh, it must uh, create a competitive tax <coughs> regime and payroll tax and stamp duties, etc. And I have some concerns here. You can't solve these things overnight. We can't walk, about away, uh, you know, walk away from some of these things immediately. But we should be starting to plan to ensure that we deliver the most efficient and effective regime uh, for industry and business so they employ people and, that we, and they can compete effectively with businesses around Australia and the rest of the world. If I look at some things, we know that payroll tax, um, most people would say it's an insidious tax, but it's, it's generating over the forward estimates three and a half to four billion dollars. We can't turn it off. But there are things that we can start to do. And it's fascinating. When you look at payroll tax, there's roughly 16,000 employers paying payroll tax. Two thirds of those, roughly two thirds of those, are, are small to medium enterprises that pay, uh, um, a, oh, sorry, small to medium enterprises that have roughly 10 to 100 employees. And they account for two thirds. In Western Australia, they pay the highest payroll tax of any state in Australia. And you sit there going, we've had the GST fix. There's been an extra $1.547 billion come into Western Australia. And we should be looking at ways to utilise that to actually ensure that these, our businesses in Western Australia are actually competitive. And there's things that we can do that actually narrow in on that focus. And, it's, and I can say it'll be less than 5 or 6 per cent of the revenue to actually make two thirds of the businesses paying payroll tax have the cheapest payroll tax in Australia. They're the sort of things that I believe is, it's really incumbent on us to work through. So I talk about cheap energy, I talk about a competitive tax regime. We must always drive for a streamlined uh, regulatory environment and, we must, and we're lucky. We've, we also uh, need to have readily available access to land. In Western Australia, we're lucky in that. We've got uh, plenty of land available. This needs to be a long to, medium to long-term focus, uh, not just for us, it's for our kids and our grandkids. And it's something that I believe that we've got to do. Um, administratively, in coming to parliament and government and with my background out of banking and finance, I, I was and I remain shocked at the lack of focus on expense management. Wages at roughly 43 per cent of, expense, of expenses, I'm staggered. There isn't regular monthly reporting on FTE actual versus budget and headcount actual versus budget. In 2016, I wrote to the Premier. Uh, and uh, we ended up with a two-hour discussion. My view is that, and, this, uh, and I've shared it, I think, privately with a few uh, members around the chamber. Uh, my view, and this is what I shared with the Premier at the time, was that the strategy of the Office for Shared Services, and we know it lost over 600 million by the time it was wound up, but in my view, the strategy of the Office for Shared Services is correct. And it's not the strategy is where this failed. It failed in the implementation. It didn't understand the change management that was required and, and it tried to swallow the whole elephant in one bite. And to me, we need to continue to look at this. We have a, a, uh, a state government, which is the largest industry in Western Australia, employing, we believe, around 150,000 people, uh, with a forecast uh, expenditure across the total state government of around $72 billion this year. And for me, I cannot believe that we, we uh, rely so heavily on Treasury to do the economic modelling and the forecasting and setting the budgets, which is all looking out the windscreen, and we don't have good visibility of what we're spending as we go through. I've never seen it in a business before. 
And I feel that we don't have enough of a business focus on the state government in what we're spending to ensure that we're delivering the most efficient and effective level of services for Western Australia. If we could find 10 per cent of savings, the actual difference that a government can make to the lives of Western Australians, both socially, environmentally or even economically, is massive. And uh, it's something that I took up uh, uh, with the Premier back in 2016. And in my view, the answer to this and where industry has gone, if you look at multinationals and multidisciplined uh, industries, they have a global C CFO. So my view is that you keep Treasury looking out the windscreen, but the Department of Finance has to have a greater role looking out the review at the monthly expenditure. And that uh, if you establish a global CFO, and this is, and, uh, this is exactly what they did in the ANZ Bank uh, in my time there, you establish a global CFO, and then every CFO in every uh, business unit in the ANZ had dual reporting. I ran a division for uh, ANZ. I had my own CFO, but he 50 per cent through to the global CFO and they controlled all the financial reporting. And then what you can do is you can standardise the financial reporting. The problem we've got in Western Australia, I agree in the principle of wanting to reduce the number of departments that the government's done, but the problem you've got is that there's 135 agencies that sit beneath it, all with different systems that don't talk to each other. And so the difficulty of everything that's still underneath is still there. And so to me, you've got to go right back and start to, if we, if we actually start to you know, create a focus on expense management, um, then you can actually standardise the financial reporting. When you standardise the financial reporting, you start to actually get um, relevant reports that actually tell you where things are going. Um, one of the things in uh, industry is to tackle discretionary expenditure. Uh, it's very difficult in state government to be able to look at those. There's no readily available report. I'll share with you, in 2014, I had a little look at, um, as I was finance minister for only six months, I decided to look at the ICT spend of government. ICT spend. And I, said, I asked the Department of Finance, what are we spending? And they said, we've got no idea. I said, can you get me a report? They said, we can't. There's no way to look at it. I said, I don't find that acceptable. I ended up getting PwC in to do a, a, an audit on the state government of what the state is spending in ICT. And the report came back and said, we can't identify exactly what the state government is spending in ICT. We estimate it's somewhere between $1.6 and $2.4 billion a year. Yeah. And what I said to the department, I said, it's not the quantum that frightens me, it's the variance. We don't know if we're spending $800 million a year or not. These are the concerns I have with the way that we actually look at this. So from an administration, there's more that I believe the state and steps the state needs to be taking that is essentially talking the same principle as what the Office for Shared Services it was, but actually taking baby steps to ensure that we can actually achieve it. And it, have to go, it has to go across multiple governments a, mul a long period of time to actually get there. This is a journey that needs to be taken by both sides of politics. Um, Members. We, uh, uh, there are a number of things that I've witnessed uh, as a member and as a, as a minister and uh, in the parliament, but I implore that all MPs remember the importance of parliament and the role it plays in our freedoms and our lifestyle. It is critical that the sanctity of parliament and our judiciary processes are retained and there can't be any individual or organisation that can be higher uh, or a higher authority than this parliament. And uh, I plead with people to bear that in mind uh, as we go forward. It's something that it's incumbent on all of us uh, to ensure that we protect for, for the uh, freedoms and the democracy that we have in Western Australia. There are some people that I must thank for their support. Uh, my family, my friends. Uh, there are too many to name. But there have been some people that have been critical at different times. Uh, that have helped me get through the system that otherwise I wouldn't have even been here. Uh, because coming in as a Member of Parliament and not being a long-term uh, player of the game, uh, there were certain uh, uh, routes that were sorted out within factions that I had no idea about. Uh, people like Peter Shatt, Raymond Picotti, uh, John Hassan. Uh, John Hassan did, uh, uh, when I went through uh, my pre-selection, uh, that was a fascinating experience, having between 30 and 40 legal challenges against the Liberal Party constitution uh, put upon me. Uh, the role that Senator Dean Smith played uh, in helping me uh, stay a Member of Parliament in my pre-selection. 
um, but also to the staff that have assisted me within my ministerial uh, office and the departmental, and then in, through to my electorate office. Uh, the three people currently in my electorate office of Denise, Carolyn and Felicity have been absolutely outstanding. The whip that they've cracked on me, particularly this last couple of years, um, in signing things and uh, uh, being out and about, um, they've done a fantastic job to ensure that I re remain uh, a good local member, and I, I thank them from the bottom of my heart. Um, in closing, though, and reflecting on the words of, of Roosevelt and the man in the arena, I would always prefer to be known as the man who failed trying than the man who failed to try. And, uh, I sort of think about, I like my basketball, Michael Jordan, you know, and, I've, and I say, you know, I've failed over and over again, and that's why I succeed. Uh, but in, as the, in the end, as Kenny Rogers said, you've got to know when to walk away. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, we have some messages to read. Message number 148. Mr Speaker, the Legislative Council acquaints the Legislative Assembly that it has agreed to the Appropriation Recurrent 2020-2021 Bill 2020 without amendment. Message number 149. Mr Speaker. The Legislative Council acquaints the Legislative Assembly that it has agreed to the Appropriation Capital 2020-2021 Bill 2020 without amendment. <laughs> Message number 150. Mr Speaker. <laughs> the Legislative Council acquaints the Legislative Assembly that it has agreed to the Mutual Recognition Western Australia Bill 2020 without amendment. So that going up. Yep. <laughs> Message number 151. Mr Speaker, the Legislative Council acquaints the Legislative Assembly that it has agreed to the Swan Valley Planning Bill 2020, subject to the amendments contained in the schedule annexed, in which amendments the Legislative Council desires the concurrence of the Legislative Assembly. Uh, Minister for Transport. One, two, five, on block. Or should it be over there? Sorry. Mr Acting Speaker, I'll say that again. I seek leave to consider amendments one to five on block. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that amendments one to five be agreed to. Uh, question is that amendments one to five be agreed to. The, what's your title? Member, Member for Hillary's. <laughs> uh, on behalf of the opposition, uh, we indicate our support uh, for these amendments. Thank you. Members, the question is that amendments one to five be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. That one. Members, message number 152 from the other place. Mr Speaker, the Legislative Council acquaints the Legislative Assembly that it has agreed to the births, deaths and marriages registration amendment, change of name bill 2018, subject to the amendments contained in the schedule annex, in which amendments the Legislative Council desires the concurrence of the Legislative Assembly. Attorney General. Mr Acting Speaker, uh, I seek leave or uh, I move that amendments number one through to number nine be taken on block. Is leave granted? Leave granted. Leave is granted. 
Uh, members, the question is that amendments one through nine no. be agreed. You've got to move them now. Yep. Move one to nine. I move that amendments one through nine in message 152 uh, be adopted. Uh, thank you, Attorney General. Um, Member for Hillary's. Thank you. Um, as the lead speaker for the opposition, I indicate uh, we support these amendments. And just very, very briefly in closing, I think uh, this completes a very, uh, very full circle for both the Attorney General, Minister for Commerce, and I in uh, working mostly together, almost all bills together, to get what is it now, Attorney General? 70 something bills? Is it? 59. 59 bills through this parliament in the just under four years that the parliament's been sitting. Uh, it's been a, an interesting journey and I want to thank the Attorney General and Minister for Commerce for his forbearance as well in, in getting there. Thank you. Members, the question is that amendments one to nine be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Members, message from number 153. Mr Speaker, the Legislative Council acquaints the Legislative Assembly that it has agreed to the Criminal Law Amendment on certain dates, Bill 2019, without amendments. And message number 154. Mr. That one? That one's on my list. Um, the Legislative Council acquaints the Legislative Assembly that it has agreed to the National Disability Insurance Scheme Worker Screening Bill 2020 subject to the amendments contained in the scheduled annex, in which amendments the Legislative Council desires the concurrence of the Legislative Assembly. Uh, Mr Acting Speaker, uh, Parliamentary Secretary. I seek leave to consider amendments one to four on block. Is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Uh, Mr Speaker, these are largely uh, technical and procedural amendments, and uh, I move that amendments number one to four be agreed to. Uh, members, the question is that amendments one to four be agreed to. Member for Hillary. Thank you. On behalf of the opposition, we indicate we support the amendments. Uh, members, the question is that amendments one to four be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. Mr. Leader of the House. Mr. Speaker, I move that the House, on its rising, uh, adjourn until a date and time to be fixed by the Speaker. And Mr Speaker, can I simply conclude? The uh, 40th Parliament now comes to an end. Uh, this is our final sitting day, of course, for the 40th Parliament. Can I wish uh, all members, uh, staff and families uh, a very Merry Christmas, uh, a safe Christmas and a very uh, 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 prosperous and uh, healthy, successful 2021 and thank them all for their uh, support uh, on behalf, as myself as Leader of the House. Thank you. Members, the question is that the motion be agreed to, Premier? No? No? All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no? I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leader of the House. The Members, the question is that the House do now adjourn. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against say no? I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.